Welcome to our first module. I'm going to assume that most of you are brand new to SQL. So new, frankly, that you might not even know what SQL really is other than a computer language used to talk to databases. So in this module, we're going to start there and both define SQL and discuss how SQL differs from other computer languages. I'll also explain the various ways that SQL is used within a database. From there, we'll compare and contrast the roles of a database administrator and a data scientist and explain the differences between one-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many -many relationships with the database. Once we've covered that, we'll learn our first statement, select, talk about some of the basic syntax rules, and go over the importance of commenting in your code so that you can start working on and writing some simple queries right away. I know you're eager to begin, and so am I. So let's get started. Welcome. In this lesson, we're going to go over what SQL is, but more particularly, how data scientists use SQL. That's really what this class is about. I don't only want you to understand how to use SQL, but I want you to understand how it's used in data science and how that may be different from how other people are using SQL. Specifically, after this lesson, you should be able to define SQL, discuss how SQL differs from many other computer languages, explain the three primary ways SQL is used with the database, and compare and contrast the roles of a database administrator and a data scientist, along with discussing the importance of knowing what SQL syntax you're using in a given database. So let's begin with the acronym SQL and what it stands for. This is Structured Query Language. This is the standard language for many relational database management systems and data manipulation. SQL is used often to query, insert, update, and modify data. At a basic level, SQL is a method for communicating between you and the database. One of the great things about SQL, though, is that it's made up of statements which are descriptive words. In other words, many of the commands used in SQL are fairly easy to interpret, as compared to many other computer languages. This makes SQL, as a language, really easy to understand and learn. However, it's important to understand that SQL is a non-procedural language. That means you won't be able to write complete applications with it. But what you can do is interact and communicate with data. This makes it relatively simple, but also very powerful language. When you think about SQL, all you need to think about is data. SQL is all about data. SQL is really used for three things. It's used to read and retrieve data, so data is often stored in a database. And you want to retrieve it or read it. And you can use SQL as a means to be a translator for that. SQL is also used as a way to write data in a database. So if you need to write data in a table or insert new data, you can use SQL as a means to do this. And finally, it's used to update and insert new data. As you can see, SQL has a really simple design, right? It's very contained in what it's able to do, which is read, write, and update data. Because of this, you will find there are a lot of people who are able to use this language. If we look at this graph, what we see is the SQL language ranked by the number of programming jobs. This is from Indeed.com in 2016. It ranks SQL as the number one language. There's a lot of jobs out there that require the use of SQL, and it's not just for data science. It's important to understand how others use SQL and how other people other than data scientists and programmers might be using it. There are many, many people who might use SQL in their jobs. This includes everything from backend developers, QA engineers, data architects, system engineers, obviously data scientists, and even data analysts. But the ones I want to talk about a little bit more are the DBAs or database administrators and how they compare to data scientists. A DBA is responsible for managing the entire database and guarding it. A data scientist, on the other hand, is typically a user of that database. The DBA will be responsible for giving permissions to people and determining who has access to what data. They're oftentimes responsible for managing the tables and creating them. We're going to go over how to create your own tables and insert data into them in a later video. However, this is something you'll likely have to get the rights to 
and often from a DBA. The ways the two positions, DBA and data scientists, are similar is that they both use SQL to understand the data, to query it, and retrieve it. They both write very complex queries, but the main difference is that the data scientist is really the end user, whereas the DBA is the one who administers it, governs it, and manages the database as a whole. Data scientists have to be able to retrieve data. We know we can't do anything until we actually have the data to work with, right? We need a way to go and get that data. SQL is really fundamental in data science because you really can't start building any models or doing any predictions until you have the data. SQL is the means to go into a database and get this data. Data scientists might also use this to create their own table or test environment. Let's say you've built a model and you want to deploy that and you want to add it back into the table. You may need to create your own table or test environment to add that into. One thing that is not unique with data scientists or other people using SQL is that you oftentimes are combining multiple tables together and a lot of times this leads to a bit more complex queries to be written for analysis. Data scientists so the number one way that they're using SQL is really to be able to retrieve their data for analysis. They might do a little of the analysis using SQL. However, the main thing they're using SQL for is for data retrieval. The last thing I want to point out is that just because you're learning SQL in the class, the syntax of what you're writing may change a little bit based on the relational database management system you're using. Again, you can think of SQL as the interpreter between you and the database. How you write some of the syntax for SQL is going to depend on the relational database management system you're interacting with. Extending our analogy, you can think of this as the accent, or maybe as the dialect. SQL is able to translate it for you, but sometimes you have to tweak it a little bit based on the database management system you're using. Here I've listed just some of the popular ones, SQL Server, PostgreSQL, MySQL. In this class, we'll be using SQLite, so I'll be teaching you the syntax based on that. I want to point out this, though, because I think it's important to understand that if there's something that doesn't work correctly when you copy data from this class into another application you're using at work, definitely check the type of relational database management system you're using and see if that makes a difference. I'll talk about this some more in an upcoming video, including some of the ways to figure out what those differences might be. Okay, that's it for this lesson, and you should be able to tell others what SQL stands for and discuss how it differs from other common computer languages. You should also be able to explain a few ways that SQL is used in a database, understand the roles of a database administrator and a data scientist, and be able to explain the importance of knowing the SQL syntax you're using within a database management system. Over the next several video lessons, we're going to spend some time talking about data models and ER diagrams. The reason why this is important is because while you may be able to learn SQL, you won't be as effective in writing your queries without an understanding of the structure of the data that you're querying against. After this particular video, you should be able to explain the importance of thinking through the design of a query that solves a particular problem before writing a single line of code, explain the importance of understanding how the data in a database relates to one another, and describe what a database is at its core. When I first started to learn SQL, I took a three-day training class, and this is what I'd call a point-and-click training class is a very basic class where you just follow the exercise in a book and duplicate what it was doing. It taught me how to write in some different select statements to retrieve some data, and I was able to perform a few operations. However, when I went off and encountered different real-world real world problems, I really had a hard time applying what I learned to most situations. It wasn't until I took another class that was a bit more theory-based that I began to understand data models, ER diagrams, and how those interact with SQL. I learned how to apply SQL to that, and that's when my queries improve by leaps and bounds. 
I was then really able to apply what I was writing and coding to pretty much any situation. This lesson is so fundamental into everything you're going to do after this. I really hope you can take the time to do your own research and get interested in this because it's going to help you understand queries and SQL in a far greater way than just purely studying SQL language itself. I think the most important thing you can learn from this class is a concept I call think before you do. What I mean by this is it's easy when you're doing work or we're trying to produce a result or solve a problem to just go in and start doing. By that I mean you go in and start to write code or maybe start to write some type of email or you're starting to form a model and recreate in your data. What I want you to do before you start to do that so before you start to go in and start to write a query, is I want you to think about what you're doing. I want you to think about what is the problem you're trying to solve. And you need to determine what is the data you need to get. And figure out how does the data relate to each other? How does it interact? You'll probably also need to think about what are some of the problems that you may want to solve with this data and need to be aware of. And what are the types of joins or business processes in the data modeling? This will really help you because not only will you get more accurate results, which is fantastic and what we want and need, but it's going to actually speed up the time it takes you to work and get things done. I think we as individuals, and I know I definitely fall into this pattern a lot, tend to think that we're getting things done by going out and writing things and acting, whether it's queries or some type of document. But if you actually take the time to think about why you're doing what you're doing before you do it, it will actually take less time to write your queries. If you really spend some time understanding how the data relates to each other, how you're going to join this data together, what columns you need, why you need it, this will then, in turn, speed up the process for writing your queries. The SQL language just falls into place then. It becomes very simple when you have a good understanding of this. If you start to think about what you're doing before you do it, you should hopefully also have less rework. And you're going to get more accurate results, and you're going to get them the first time. In thinking before you do, it's important to both understand what you're thinking about and what you're doing. When you're writing queries, I've talked a little bit about how this is a translation system for you to communicate with the database. It's important to understand what a database is. A database is really a container that is usually a file or set of files and is used to organize and store all of the data. If you think of this in real world terms, It'd be like a filing system that has many cabinets along a wall. Within that system, within a database, we have tables. These tables are a structured list of data elements or a specific data type. Going back to our analogy, you can think of this as maybe one of the cabinets within a whole wall of cabinets. Then if we dive further into the cabinet, into a table, what we find is we have columns and rows which of course is what makes up a table. A table is made up of a series of individual columns, and then a row in a table is a record. Through tables, rows, and columns, ultimately throughout the database, we have a mechanism to store and retrieve data, and through data modeling, a way to organize and join data together for the purposes of data analysis, and we'll discuss that later on in our course. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue where we left off in our last video by talking a little bit about the evolution of data modeling and consequently SQL database systems themselves. It's actually a pretty interesting history that really begins in the 1960s as computers were really coming into their own as a business and research tool. After this particular lesson, you should be able to describe what data modeling is, define a relational database system, and discuss the advent of the relational databases in SQL. Data modeling is what we use to organize information for multiple tables and how they relate to each other together. This helps tremendously in providing structure to the information in the system. Usually a data model represents a business process, 
and it can also help you understand a business process. A lot of times, you'll work with a business person in understanding the data and how it fits together. But at the same time, that business person will learn a lot from the data modeler to better understand how their business actually works together by seeing the data and how it interacts with each other. The thing to remember about data models is that it should always represent a real-world problem as closely as possible. There are a couple different types of models, and there has been an evolution of data models. When I talk about data models here, it's important to realize the difference between a model for prediction, which data scientists often build, versus a data model, which is really a way that the tables are represented and organized in a database. The evolution of data models has gone on since the 1960s. There's been hierarchical, network, relational entity, relational somatic, and, and NoSQL. I'm not going to go into great detail into all of these different types of data models. If this is interesting to you, I definitely recommend you do your own research. It's widely available on the internet and it will only help you in other aspects of working with data. I'm just going to briefly talk a little bit about the relational and NoSQL. The reason I'm talking about the relational is this is what we're going to work with a lot when writing SQL queries. The benefits of a relational model is that they really simplify the connections between the data and what it does is easily allow you to write queries against it, retrieve it, update, and write data to it. NoSQL came onto the scene around 2009. It was really part of the big data movement that you may have heard something about. I think it's important to understand that NoSQL is out there, especially as you're learning the SQL course. I think it's also important to realize the differences between the other data models and NoSQL. Just to touch on SQL in the big data world, NoSQL is really a mechanism for storage and retrieval where it's not modeled in a tabular relational format. NoSQL was really popular when big data and unstructured data first came out because you left it unstructured but it's now started to soften a little bit and more commonly referred to as not only SQL. This will be one of the discussion items in this module. Something I want you to think about and research a little bit more is, does SQL really have a role still in the big data world as new things start to come out like NoSQL and unstructured data? Okay, that wraps it up for this lesson. You should have a good sense of what data modeling is and a basic understanding of a relational database. In the next lesson, we'll discuss how relational and transactional databases differ. Okay, now let's wrap up our discussion about data models by getting back to talking about the type of data models we'll be working with in this class. After this video, you should be able to define and describe both relational and transactional database models, define entities, attributes, and a relationship, describe and explain the difference between one-to-one, -one, one-to-many, and many-to-many -many relationships, describe the use of a primary key in a database, and explain how ER diagram is used to document and illustrate relationships. I want to kick off this video by talking a little bit about relational versus transactional database models. A relational model is a database design that shows the relationships between the different tables, and this is really used to optimize querying data, making it easy and intuitive to access the data. Transactional, on the other hand, you can think of as a more operational database. If you are in healthcare, for example, you may have a transactional database that is used to store all the claims information, and then this information may not be stored in a great way for querying and using it for analysis. In fact, you may need to take and extract that transactional information from the database and move it into a relational model. Most of what we'll be working with in this class is the relational model. The building blocks for this relational model are really three simple things. We have entities, which are a person, place, thing, or event. These are very distinguishable. They are unique. They are distinct. For example, I could be an entity, Sadie St. Lawrence, and then ha we have attributes, which are characteristics of this entity. As an entity, it would be myself, and then an attribute about me would be that I am female. Then the third building block of the model is the relationship. This describes the association among different entities. 
There are a few types of relationships in a database, and the ones I want to cover are the three shown here, one-to-many, many-to-many, and one-to-one. -one. If you think of a one-to-many relationship, this could be one customer that has many invoices. When you think of a many-to-many -many relationship, this could be an example of many students to many classes. You may have one student who belongs to lots of different classes, or you may have a class who has many different students. Then if you think of a one-to-one -one relationship, this is a manager to a store. Let's say you have a sporting goods store, and each of those stores has only one manager. That would be one example of a one-to-one -one relationship. To understand these relationships between the tables a lot better, What's often used to depict this are ER diagrams. An ER model then is composed of the entity types and the specific relationships that can exist between these entities. These are usually displayed in a visual format and it re represents the relationship between the tables. It often helps you to understand and represent a business process and it will show the links between these tables. The links are really important because in a later lesson, we're gonna learn how to join these tables together and combine the data. Being able to look at this diagram and see how they relate to each other is really important. What we will use to join these tables together are two things. We can use the primary keys or foreign keys. The primary key is a column or set of columns whose values uniquely identify every row in a table then this allows us to take those unique identities and then join it to another table. Foreign keys are similar, but in regard that one or more columns can be used together to identify a single row in the table. When we're looking at ER diagrams, which again is one of the ways you will start to think before you do, you'll look at maybe an ER diagram and understand what data elements you are trying to join together and how do you need to get them. But one of the things you need to understand is how to read this. We talked a little bit about relationships and the different relationships between a table. And then there was a different type of notation that explains the relationships. We have the Chen notation, and there's the Crow's Foot notation, and then there's the UML class diagram notation. The Chen notation uses 1 to M for a 1 to many relationship, and M and N for a many to many relationship and a one-to-one -one for a one-to-one -one relationship. In crow's foot notation, we have the train tracks, which represent one, and then the crow's foot, which represents many. And finally, with UML, we have a 1.1, which represents the concept of one, and one point asterisk, which represents the concept of many. Definitely take notes of these. You'll be looking at ER diagrams quite frequently, and you'll need to understand these notations when reading ER diagrams so you can understand how you're going to write your query and join the table together, or even to find out what's listed in the table. This is really part of that thinking before you start doing concept I was talking about earlier. Having a good understanding of why the data is structured in a particular way and how to read the ER diagrams will be very helpful to you in writing your queries and ensuring you get accurate results. In this video lesson, we're going to go through the backbone of retrieving data with the select statement. As we talked about previously, the majority of what data scientists are doing with SQL is retrieving data. To be able to do that, and get you started, the first statement we are gonna use is called the select statement. After this lesson, you'll be able to write a basic select statement, tell a database what table you want your data from, select either all or particular columns from a table in a query, and limit the amount of data that is returned in a query. With a select statement, you're going to specify two pieces of information, what you want to select and where you want it from. Let's look at the concept using an example. So in this example, I'm going to select product name, that's a column from the table I want, and then I'm going to say where I want to get it from. So I want to get it from products. The output of this is then going to look like the column listed below, which it has the column product name and then all of the list of products. We have shampoo, toothpaste, deodorant, and toothbrush. If you want to retrieve more than a single column from a table, 
then what you need to do is add the names of the individual columns together. But add a comma after you add the column name. So in this example, we'll still select from the products table, but we'll also select the product name, the product ID, and the product price. You can see below that I've written this same query in two different ways. I like to usually write it the second way because it helps me make sure I don't forget any commas after I wrote a column name that I'm selecting. So each statement is the same. One to me is just a little bit easier to read, so that's why I write it the second way. But both statements will produce the same results. Now let's say you have a table that has 20 columns and you want all of the columns in the table. Instead of having to write out each individual column, which would take quite a while, there is a wildcard that you can use, which is the asterisk. So you can put select star and then from products, and this is going to go ahead and grab everything from the products table, each individual column, and put it into your output. So that's the fundamentals of using select. Anytime you're retrieving data, you are going to have a select statement. Because you're retrieving data, you need to say something as, hey, go get me something. This is what select is for. And the from that accompanies it will always go hand in hand because if you're selecting something, you need to tell SQL in the database where to get it from. A lot of times though, we may want to pull the whole table to get a view of it, to understand what data is in there. So we may do a select star. But if there is something like 5 million records in it, and we may just really want to get a sample of that. So just to view some of the data in the table, we may need to limit our results. To do this, we can select the columns we want from the table we want. Then, after the from statement, we're just going to put a statement that says limit. And you can put the number. For this, I'm going to limit it to 5. So I just want to see the first 5 records. Here though, I've also listed the differences in how this syntax of this is written for different relational database management systems. I'm not going to spell it out individually for every statement and how it differs from the different systems. But this, as I've mentioned before, I want you to be aware of that there are differences in syntax. In the meantime, we're using SQLite. If you understand it's limit 5, and then you switch over to a DB2 system, that's still something you can easily Google in terms of saying, hey, I'm using a DB2 system and I want to be able to limit my results. What's the syntax to be able to do that? Just know that here, in this example, we're going to use a limit 5 because we're working with SQLite. But you can see that for Oracle, you can use where the number of row number is greater than or equal to a number. Then for DB2, you can use fetch the first five rows. Okay, so that's it for this one. So this video has really gone over the backbone of retrieving data. I showed you a couple examples of how to select an individual column, multiple columns, a whole table, and then also how you can limit your results. These are really the key things you need to know in order to understand writing basic queries. So we've spent some time discussing the basics of databases and how to retrieve data from tables. But there's something else we can do with SQL too, and that's actually create new tables and store data within them. In this lesson, you'll learn how to be able to discuss situations where it's beneficial to create new tables, create new tables within an existing database, write data in a new table, and define whether columns can accept null values or not. The ability to create tables and store data in them is really beneficial as a data scientist because you're always making models and building predictions. You may want to take those predictions that you create and write them back to a database. This ensures that someone else could then pick up those predictions and use them in a dashboard they're creating, or maybe you want to create a dashboard or visualize it with another tool that can be hooked up and used with that database. It's also helpful if you're extracting data off the web or scraping it from somewhere and you want to store this data in a database with the rest of your information. That way you can then join it back together. As we previously discussed, the data scientist isn't usually the one in charge of managing the entire database. 
that's usually left to the DBA or some type of administrator. However, they may have capabilities to be able to write and create their own tables. So it's important to have a basic understanding of how this works. In order to do this, there is a statement that we use called create table. So in this example, I want to create a table that is about the different shoes I have on my shoe rack. Maybe I want to start to look at things like how long I've had the shoe, the different brands, how much I paid for them, or look for shoes that I have that are similar or maybe different colors. I may even want to look and see if I'm missing any shoes from my wardrobe. For this statement, you're going to need a table name. Then you also need the name and definition of the columns. In this, you'll also need to define the data type. To do this, we're going to write the statement create table. We'll put the name of the table and then in brackets we will separate out the list of columns that we're going to name this table. In this example I have the columns as shoe ID, the brand, the shoe type, the color, the price, and the description. After I list the column I'm going to define the data type. For this I'm putting I want this to be a character with 10. Then I'm defining some specifications around that column. The shoe ID is going to be my primary key in this example. You can see by the other columns, I've also defined the data type, how many characters or decimals I will allow to be inserted into this column. Then I also put whether or not I'm allowing no values in this. If I'm not specifying, then it's assuming that no values are accepted. In this example, it's a pretty simple example because the syntax for creating these tables varies greatly by relational database management system that you're using. This will give you the basic structure to create your table. However, it's important to look at the specifications of your relational database management system you're using so that you can get the correct syntax for this. An important thing to note when creating these tables is defining whether a column can contain a null value or is a primary key. Every column you have in a table can either accept null values or not, and you need to define this capability. As shown in this example, I've created a table with several columns, some of which cannot accept null values. Those are not null lines. And the one column that can accept null value, the one line that has null in it. It's important to not confuse null values with empty strings. Null values really are the absence of everything, whereas empty strings, there's actually a value there. It might be spaces or something like that. Another thing that's important to remember is anything that you're defining as a primary key cannot accept null values. So the one line listed here as the primary key wouldn't be able to accept null values for this example. As previously defined in the example, I said that shoe ID was the primary key. Therefore, this can never have an empty value or not any value. The other thing that's important to remember is that if you indicate that a column cannot be null, then you are going to get an error if you do not enter a value into that column when you're inserting data into it. This is just a check to make sure that in the columns that you've determined are non-nulls, values will always be present. Otherwise, you'll get an error returned. In order to get the data into the table, after you've defined the table, the columns, and the data types you want to add into it, there are really two ways to do this. The first way is to insert with the insert statement. You can say, insert into shoes. So I'm saying I want to put this data into the shoes table. I want to put the values in after that. So, in this, I have put the values into a single parenthesis. I've listed them out in order. Now, this works fine. However, I wouldn't recommend using this first example. How this first example is going to work is that it's going to take the first value indicated and put it in the first column. The second value will go into the second column, and the third value into the third column, and so on and so forth. And it will put them in order. As I said before, it works, however, it's not recommended. You have no guarantee of what data is going into which column. So it's a lot better to be a little bit more specific about this. 
For this, what you want to do is you want to use the same statement, insert into shoes. Before I put the values, I'm going to list the columns that I want it to insert into. Here I'm listing it in the same order. Shoe ID, brand, type, color, price, and description. However, this time, after that, I'm also indicating the values that I want to go in that same order. This can be really beneficial if you want to insert just a few values into a column. So for this example, I could remove the first three, so I could remove the type, brand, and ID. I would just remove those by crossing those out. Then it also removed the first three values here. Now I'm guaranteed that the values pink, 695, and then null are going to go into color, price, and description. I would recommend using this method. It's a little bit safer because you have more control. You know exactly where the data is going and into which column. Okay, so let's stop there for now. In this video, you learn all about how to create tables using SQL. We discussed situations where that's a useful thing to do. We talked about the syntax for creating a new table and went over how to store data in it. There's another thing you can do with tables and that is to create a temporary table. We'll go over this in our next lesson. So in our last lesson, we went over how to create tables in a database using SQL. Another option we have is to create a copy essentially of another table or pull a subset from another table. We can create a whole table from this, or we can create what is called a temporary table. And that's what we're gonna go over in this video. After this lesson, you should be able to create temporary tables, describe the limitations of temporary tables, and discuss some strategies for researching syntax for particular database management systems. Okay, first of all, the most important thing to know about these temporary tables is that these will be deleted when the current client session is terminated. That's why they're called temporary tables. However, these are really good to use because they're a lot faster than creating a real table. So if you have complex queries and you want to simplify it a bit by creating a subset and then joining to that subset and deriving a new calculation from that, then temporary tables are a great option. For this, we use the statement create temporary table. Then we put the name of the temporary table we want to create. Then this I'm pulling in as a subset from another table. I'm going to say add. Then in my brackets, I'm going to put my select statement of where I want to get this from. In this case, I'm pulling a subset of data from my shoes table. Right here, I'm just creating a temporary table that is the shoe type sandals. Now I create an individual table, which is just going to have those shoes that are sandals. As mentioned before, the way you create tables, update them, and insert them is heavily dependent on the relational database management system you're using. In this class, we're using SQLite. However, you do not have right privileges to this. You won't be able to write any data to this, but I think it's important to realize you need to look up this information on your own based on the company you're at and the type of relational database management system they're using at that time. This graph depicts the flow of what you need in order to create a temporary table. So as you can see, there's a little bit more detail here. What I would highly recommend is looking up the relational database management system you're using and then finding the syntax detail for how to create the table with the relational database management system you're using. It's really great if you can become your own researcher and troubleshooter when working with SQL. The key is to really never stop learning. Learning how to optimize your queries or how to work with relational database management systems. For this, I really want to teach you the core basics and the fundamentals so that you would know how to think logically about these problems and work through them. At the end of the day, you're going to be your own best teacher. For this, I recommend Googling or using Stack Overflow, which is a site dedicated to asking and answering coding questions. You'll be able to get a lot of great information there. As this language is dependent on the database management system you're using, make sure that when you're typing or researching these items, that you're typing the name of the database management system in as well. This will be helpful because you may find the solution to your problem implemented.
There may be different syntax based on the relational database management system you're using. I'd like to challenge you to research some of these things on your own based on the relational database management system you're using at work. Go ahead and look up the statements for updating tables and deleting tables and see if there's anything related to the database management system you're using. So to wrap up, in this lesson we learned how to create temporary tables and write data to them. We also covered some limitations of using temporary tables, chiefly that they are temporary, and we talked about some strategies to research different syntaxes for SQL statements. I really encourage you to do some research in this regard. You will always learn a lot when you go out and explore these topics on your own. Hi there. So as you can probably guess, SQL code can get pretty messy. While well, we've only focused on simple queries so far, most queries are multiple and often many lines long. Sometimes it can be difficult for you or someone else looking at your code to understand what's going on in the design of the query. So in this video, we're going to talk about adding comments to our SQL code in order to help shed light on what we're trying to do with our code. Adding comments is important not only because it makes your queries easy to understand, both for you and for others, it's also going to help with troubleshooting your code and making your code easier to share overall. After this lesson, you should be able to discuss the importance of writing comments as a part of your code, describe several comment syntaxes that can be used in SQL, and of course, actually write comments in your code. Let's begin. If you've written in any other programming language, you know that comments are helpful when you've written some code and you've gone away from it for a while and when you come back to work on it again. You want to understand what you were doing. The same thing applies here. You may write some code to retrieve some data, go back work on it for a while, and then decide to come back and modify your query for the data you want to retrieve. Just adding a few helpful comments here and there is just going to make it far easier to understand what you were doing and why you were doing it. But you can also use the comments to mute the expression of some code, frequently referred to as commenting out code. This technique helps you troubleshoot some of the issues you have with your query a little bit better. You can effectively get rid of parts of your query without actually getting rid of the statements themselves and then bring them back in one by one to see where your query goes awry. So there are two ways to add comments. One is by adding single line comments and the other is by adding a section of comments. In this, I'm selecting shoe ID, brand ID, my shoe name from shoes. And I just want to comment out the brand ID. I don't need it here. So I'm going to add two dashes and it's just going to remove that whole line. When I run this code block, that's what's going to happen is I'm just going to get the return for the shoe ID and the shoe name. And the next example that I've done is comment out a section of the code. As you can see to do this, I've used a combination of a backslash and an asterisk. What this is effectively saying is don't run anything between the two backslashes and the asterisk. This you can use for a large portion of queries, and it becomes really helpful when you want to just narrow down the one individual line that you want to run. Use these before your select statement to denote what you're doing. Also use these to cross out portions of what you're doing and to troubleshoot different aspects of your code. At the same time, as helpful as comments are, you can definitely have comments go wrong. So it's important to understand how adding comments in the right way can be helpful to you in understanding your code, but sometimes comments can be overly done and can definitely confuse you. I think it's good to realize keeping your code organized, keeping it in a really standard format is just going to make it a lot easier to read. And then add comments where it doesn't follow the normal flow or syntax or just little points that you may want to read or note for later. Here are a couple examples where there are too many comments and comments gone wrong. And this is another example where the code is just much more simple, easy to read, and you can definitely follow what's happening by looking at it and following the logical pattern through reading each one. But you can also, at the same time, see where comments are placed really eloquently at just the right place to help you understand what's going on. 
Now, one last point that isn't really part of comments discussion, but something you may find helpful in general, is using a source code or text editor. A lot of times, the relational database management system you're using will have somewhere to input your queries. But sometimes just writing them outside in a source co code editor so that you can modify them and save them is really helpful. One I use all the time and always recommend is Notepad++. It might be something you're interested in downloading and using to start writing your queries. It can also help a lot with automatically color highlighting your different statements and can help you with some of the indention to make sure you're writing your code and it's nice and clean. Okay, that wraps it up for our discussion on comments. Now you should be able to start writing comments in your SQL code to help yourself and others understand your design intentions. I heartily recommend you get in the habit of commenting in all your coding now, as you're just beginning with SQL. So it's something that becomes second nature to you as you work on more complex queries going forward. All right, we went over a ton of material in the first module. I just wanna take a quick moment to recap before we move on. We first began by defining SQL. You should know now that SQL stands for Structured Query Language, and that it's a standard language used to communicate with relational database management systems. Speaking of relational database management systems, you should also know the difference between a transactional and a relational database. We also began to go over the very important concept of primary keys, foreign keys, and table relationships. Pin that because we're going to revisit these concepts in a lot more detail later in the course when we start talking about joins. We also discussed some basic SQL syntax. And you should now be able to write basic query statements using select and from. Finally, we are wrapped up by going over how to write comments in your code, which are essential to include so that both you and your colleagues can follow what you're doing and trying to do in your code. It's a really good habit to get into as you're starting out. So be sure to keep practicing that aspect as you begin to write your first query statements with SQL. In our next module, we're going to go over the methods for sorting, filtering, and paring down your data results. As you've probably seen by now, some data sets contain millions of records, and it would be crazy to try and look at all of them. So this is an important skill to have. I look forward to seeing you there. Now that you've begun writing your first SQL statements, you're probably really starting to see just how much data you can pull down from databases. So far, what you've been experimenting with only has been a few thousand records, but many databases have a lot more data in them. Someday you might work with databases with the millions or even tens of millions of records in it. It almost boggles the mind, right? Well, clearly, we're never going to want to look at all of that data at once. So thankfully, SQL gives us several methods to pare down and sort our data so we can quickly get the results we want. That's what we're gonna discuss in this module. I'm going to introduce you to several methods for filtering data. At the end of this module, you'll know how to use several more clauses and operators, including where, between, in, or, not, like, order by, and group by. In addition, I'm going to tell you about wildcards, which allow us to search for more specific or parts of record, including their disadvantages and advantages, and how we can best use these wildcards. We'll also discuss how to use some basic math operators, as well as aggregate functions like average, count, min, and max, and we'll start to begin analyzing our data. Obviously, this module's jam-packed with new information. So let's not waste any more time and go ahead and get started. So we've learned all about the basics of actually acquiring data from a table using select and from commands. But that's only part of the story because most of the databases contain thousands or even millions of records. Often we don't want to look at all that data. I know I don't. In this lesson, we're going to go over filtering with SQL. Filtering is extremely important because it allows us to narrow the data we want to retrieve. Filtering is also used when you're doing analysis to get very specific about the data you want to analyze as part of your model. After you've watched this video, you should be able to 
Describe the basics of filtering your data. Use the WHERE clause with common operators. Use the BETWEEN clause and explain the concept of a null value. All right, we have a lot to cover, so let's begin. Filtering SQL is important to understand because we have a couple of options as to where we can filter down our data and get specific. But there's some huge benefits when we're doing it directly with SQL instead of relying on the client application to do it. First of all, when we filter our data down, it will often reduce the number of records we're retrieving. Instead of just going and grabbing a whole table and pulling every column and row from it, we can get really specific about the data we want to obtain from that table. And subsequently, that reduces how much data we're pulling in from the system. Reducing the amount of data you're analyzing will of course speed up the query performance, which in turn will speed up our overall processing. It also helps when we add the filtering at the database level because this reduces the strain on the client side of the application, which will also allow it to run better. Before you go and pull a whole table into a program like R to start doing analysis, filter that data down before you even pull it means you won't have as much data to churn through when you're analyzing it. Again, we want to try and push as many filters down as possible because databases are really optimized to do this. It also then helps to make sure that we're not straining our client application and ultimately ensures we're getting the data we want and need. To do this, we use what's called the WHERE clause. And the WHERE clause comes after we use our SELECT and FROM. You have to select your columns and then choose which table you want the columns from. And then you add WHERE along with your column name operator value. There's a couple different operators that you could use. You could use equals, not equals, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, between, and is null. We're going to go through a couple applications and examples of each of these operators. In the first example, we're going to filter just on a single condition. For this, again, we have select our product name, our unit price, our supplier IDs, but we want to just look at the suppliers and the unit price for the product name tofu. So after the from, we're going to add where product name equals, and then we enter what we want it to equal. In this case, tofu is a string variable. So we're going to put the string in individual quotes. As you can see, the result is a single line where the product name is tofu. And then we also have the unit price and supplier ID. For that, in this example, if we had multiple records that were named tofu, we would see more rows. But in this example, we happen to just have one record, which is named tofu. So we only see the one row. Another way to do this is to filter on a single value. In the last example, we had a string, so a single condition but maybe we want to look at products whose prices are greater than or equal to 75. So in this example, we'll take the columns that we're interested in and we'll get the data from the product tables. But this time, we're going to look at the records where the unit price is greater than or equal to 75. As you can see now, we get multiple records retrieve. But if you look at the unit price, all of the records for this unit price is greater than or over a value of 75. One tip I like to do is maybe I didn't actually need the unit price in my data. I just want to filter out those records that are greater than 75. Before I run this, I didn't need to pull in the unit price as one of the columns, but what I like to do is leave it in there to include it just for a little while, just to make sure I'm really getting what I think I'm getting. When you're just starting to write queries and testing them, I would leave in some of the columns for what you're filtering on in there. But if you don't need it, then you definitely don't need to pull it in. Another way we can filter is by looking for non-matches. Maybe you don't have just a list of one product that you want to go after, such as tofu. Maybe you have a whole bunch of products, but you know that you don't want a particular single product or a couple of products. It would be easy just to say, give me everything except blank. Again, we're going to look at products and their prices from different suppliers. But for this query, we don't want to include a specific product name, Ellis Mutton. 
So basically, we want to pull all records except that. We'll add our operator in this case, not equals, and then because this is a string value, we'll add those single quotes around the string we want to filter out. What's really handy though is you can filter for a range of values. This is a little bit different because it doesn't have an operator. What it does use is between and and. It's still the same format, but this way we can filter in where the units and stock are between 15 and 80. And so it really rolls off the tongue in the way you write it because you're going to put the column in that you're interested in units and stock, and then between the two numbers that you're looking for. So to do this, I just want to put between 15, and I want to make, to sh want to make sure to include and before the next condition. Here you can see I pull in the units and stock, and you can see the result for that are all between 15 and 80. Another example we'll go through through is filtering for no value. In this example, what we're doing is filtering for something that is null. It's really important again to remember the difference between nulls and zeros. A null is very different than having a price that is zero. A null means that there is actually no data in this column. If you want to look at something where you know the price is zero, or it is an empty string, then you need to type that in as your condition. If you want to look for something where there is just no information for that column, that's where you would want to simply use is null. Here we're going to use where the product name is null. Maybe we're doing some profiling of our data and we want to see are there any records missing from this column. This is a great way just to check and see does the column representing the product names have some type of information for every record? So for this query, I'm asking for the records that have null value of the product name. Because I get no values returned with this search, that means that all the product names have some value in them. Again, remember the difference between null and where there is actually a zero or an empty string. All right, so in conclusion, remember the different operators that we have for this. Equals, not equals, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, along with between and is null. Remember also to always use your where clause and then feel free to get creative. This is something I really think forms the backbone of many SQL statements. For many queries, you'll have the select from and then more often than not, you'll be filtering down with the WHERE clause in some regard to limit the number of records returned. Welcome! In this video, we're going to build off the last one and we're going to go over some more advanced filtering techniques. If you've already tried out some of the operators in the last lesson, you'll understand that they're very powerful and you can do a lot with them. We're just going to expand on those in a little bit by going over the in, or, and not operators. After this lesson, you'll be able to use the in and or operators in detail to filter out your data and get the results you want, differentiate between the use of the in and between operators, discuss the importance of the order of operation when using these operators, and explain how and when to use the not operator. Okay, first let's discuss in. To use the in operator, what we're going to do is specify a range of conditions. This is similar to between, where you could say it's between two variables. You can also do a very specific number of conditions and have additional conditions. To do this, you're going to enclose your values in parentheses, and you're going to have a comma delimited list of values. In this example, what we're going to do is look for suppliers but we want an individual list of this. We only want suppliers 9, 10, and 11. Another example would be to have suppliers maybe 1, 5, and 10. This is something where between wouldn't have been helpful because we aren't looking for a range of values. We're looking for specific values. In this example, we'll go with our select statement where we're getting it from, and we'll add where supplier ID is in and we'll indicate the values 9, 10, and 11 in this example. You can also add string values. 
but just remember, those have to be added in with single quotes to indicate that they are string values. As you can see by the results return, what we have is a product ID, the unit price for those products, but we've limited our results to the suppliers that are 9, 10, and 11. Another operator is the OR operator. An important thing to know about this is that a database management system will not evaluate the second condition if the first condition is met. So you're not going to want to use this for something when you want to check for both of the values. Remember that you would want to use AND in that instance. For this example, you're using product name. I want to make sure that I am very specific that I want tofu over kombu because once it finds tofu, it's not going to give me the other product names. This is really helpful if this is indeed what you want, but if not, just be really specific about the order that you're placing the items in in your query. You may be thinking though that in and or can accomplish the same thing, and they can depending on how things are written. I couldn't have written this instead having said where product name equals tofu or kombu, or if I wanted both of them to choose where product name in and then in parentheses lifts the two values. But there are some benefits to using one versus the other. If you're using in, in gives you a lot more options in how many things you can list. Within, you can list multiple things. I could have listed 10 different product names and brought it all back. Or it's just going to give me two. And in actually executes faster than or. So that's another benefit to using in. Within, you don't have to think about the order in which you're placing your different conditions. And another benefit, and probably the main benefit of using in, is that we can use another select statement for subqueries, which is something we'll go over in a later lesson. But just keep this in the back of your mind for now. Another thing you can use with or, though, is and. I want to go through this a little bit more detail because you may get some different results if you're not careful. In this example, what I'm looking for is products where I have a specific group of suppliers, but I also have a specific unit price I want it to be above as well. I could write it as I did in the first example. I have my select statement, and I have where it's from, and I have where supplier ID equals 9 or equals 11. And I also add the unit price is greater than 15. What you'll notice though is I'm getting some unit prices that are not greater than 15. And so one of the things to understand about why this is happening is because SQL is processing the OR before the AND. And so one of the ways to limit this is to use parentheses. In the next example, you can see I have the same exact statement and query, except I place parentheses around supplier ID and then have and unit price. Now you can see I'm actually getting all the values I'm wanting. All my unit prices are greater than 15 and my supplier ID are just those of 9 and 11. An important thing to understand here is just the order of operations when using and and the or operators. You don't have to use the parentheses, but it's always really good just to get in the habit of doing it. This way, you're not relying on the default order of operations, but you really can never be too sure. So I would recommend to just get in the habit of using the parentheses when using OR and AND together. The last thing we're going to go over for filtering is the NOT operator. This is just a way to exclude different options. Again, this is a great way when you want pretty much everything, but there's maybe just a few variables you don't want. So in this example, I'm looking for different employees, but I don't want any one of the employees who are from London or Seattle. So to do this, I'll just put where not city equals London, and then not city equals Seattle. Again, using single quotes to denote the strings London and Seattle. And as you can see in our results, it returned everything except for those two cities that I had specified not to include. So in this video, we've gone over using the in, or, 
and the not operators. Remember, within and or, you can accomplish some of the same things, but there are some benefits to using in versus or in certain cases. Again, if you're using or and and together, really be careful of your order of operations and use parentheses. And use of the not is pretty straightforward. So just keep that in your toolbox as you're thinking through your query designs. Have you ever come across data where you knew either the beginning or end of something, but didn't know the rest of it? Or maybe you know that something is like something else, but slightly different. Well, in continuing our discussion with filtering in this module, we're going to take the next step and discuss the use of the wildcards and the like operator. After this video lesson, you should be able to explain the concept of wildcards, including their advantages and disadvantages when they are use and when they are useful. Describe how to use the like operator with wildcards and write out the appropriate syntax when using wildcards. All right, so the use of wildcards is a really powerful technique, especially when it comes to string values or text data. As data scientists, we often analyze these values or maybe just pull a portion of the information from a column or field. Wildcards get used frequently when doing different types of analysis and retrieving your data. A wildcard is a special character used to match parts of a value. What you're doing is searching for a pattern made up of literal text. You know, the beginning of a phrase, ending of a phrase, and you're able to pull data for that based on your search conditions. One of the things you'll use though with this is the like operator. Like is actually technically a predicated predicate, not an operator, but oftentimes it just gets referred to as an operator. So that's what we'll refer to as here. A thing to know with a like is that it can be used for string variables and non-text data types. So these wildcards cannot be used for numerical data. Again, though, this is really helpful for data scientists as you're working with strings and you're working with text data, because at some point you'll probably want to do some text analysis and you'll want to pare down the columns or the data you're retrieving in an easy way. Wildcards allow you to do just this. To use the wildcard, what you'll do is add a percent sign before, after, or in the middle of what you're searching for. So I love pizza. I'm always looking for good pizza. So maybe in my data set, I want to find things with the word pizza in it. There's a lot of ways I can search for this. If I add the wildcard before the word pizza, I'm going to find anything or any phrase that ends with the word pizza. If I add the wild card after the word pizza, it's going to grab anything after the word pizza. So I'm just pizza crazy and want pizza in the middle of everything. Then I'll add the wild cards on both sides of the word. Wild cards become helpful because a lot of times you'll see data that has just a whole string of information in it. In the Northwind database, some of the product descriptions will tell you how many ounces a unit holds, and then it goes on to tell you how many packages are in the box. But maybe you just want to know the word package or box from the list of the string variables. This is a really great way to start to parse out that information and may be that may be hard to retrieve. It can also help in decluttering things or just doing a general overall search. Another way you can use a wildcard is in the middle of two letters. I may search for something that starts with S and ends with E. And this then, in turn, would grab my name, Sadie, because my name starts with S and ends with E. It's not common, but may be helpful if you're looking for, say, different emails. In this example, I'm looking for maybe somebody whose emails are Tom, or I'm just interested in all the emails that start with T. I'm going to put T, then I'm going to put my wild card. And maybe I'm particularly interested in those emails that are at gmail.com. And these records, I'm specifically searching for all Gmail addresses. And so this is one example where you would use a wild card right in the middle, where it starts with a phrase and ends with a phrase. 
it's important to note that the wild cards will not match null values. Again, remember nulls are really no value in the column. You wouldn't be able to use a wild card in those cases. Some of the ways you use wildcards, and I won't go into too much detail here because it really depends on your relational database management system, but you can use wildcards with underscores. In this example, we're going to have where size is like and then underscore pizza. This is going to produce an output where it ends in the word pizza and then it brings everything before that. This isn't supported by DB2, which is a pretty popular system but I think it's important to note because most other systems support it. You can do it in another example where you just have your wildcard pizza and it's gonna produce the same results. Another one is to use brackets to specify a character in a specific location within a string. I won't go into a lot of detail about this because in this class we're using SQLite and brackets used in this manner are not supported by SQLite. But just be aware that there are different ways to use wildcards in, in different database management systems. Again, it's really important to rely on your da relational database management system and what wildcards it uses. But again, the concept behind wildcards are all the same in all systems. Now, there are some downsides to using wildcards. One, queries using wildcards take a little bit longer to run. If you can use another operator such as equals, greater than, or less than to achieve your same results, you'll get a lot better performance out of your system. However, wildcards are really helpful because they can help you find a wider range of things, such as with a phrase that ends in something or starts with something. Sometimes they are the only option you have, but if it is possible, use another operator. And finally, be careful on where you're putting your wildcards. Just remember that I always recommend when you're starting a new query to start slow, build upon it, and do some simple testing before you add it into your larger query. Okay, so we've gone over a whole bunch of techniques for getting data and filtering it down to what we're looking for. But have you noticed anything? There's no logical order to that data. It's just returned in the same order it was entered or captured in the database to begin with. It's not in any numerical order or sorting, ascending or descending according to the alphabet. It's essentially presented in a random order. Well, in this lesson, we're going to bring some order to that chaos by going over the order by clause to sort out our data. So this is a really simple concept, but as you'll see with most things in SQL, they're pretty simple concepts, but they're really powerful when you add them together. These little tips and tricks that you use when you're writing your queries or looking at your data, just simple things like being able to sort your data can really help you understand the results and what you're getting back. So after this lesson, you should be able to discuss the importance of sorting data for analysis purposes, explain some of the rules related to using the order by clause, and actually use the order by clause to sort data either in ascending or descending order. All right, so let's begin. So to sort data with SQL, we use the order by clause. Sorting data in a particular way can be really helpful when viewing data. Otherwise, our data could be returned in a manner which makes it a bit more difficult to interpret. Data in tables is not usually consistently ordered as the data can be updated, deleted, or changed at any point. A lot of times, you really can't rely on the data being returned in any logical order. So if you really want to look at your data in a particular order, it's always good to be specific about the order you want it to be in. The other thing is, a lot of times when you're looking at data, you're not going to be able to look at all the records the other thing is, a lot of times when you are looking at data, you're not going to be able to look at all the records. Sorting your data in a logical fashion can help you easily look at the information that you want on top. It's really helpful to be specific always about your data that you're retrieving, but also about how you want to do that. Order by allows us to sort data by particular columns. Now, there are a few rules when using order by. One is that it can take multiple column names. 
you can order by one column or can order it by all the columns and so it goes in the fashion that you want it to add them in. If you're doing multiple columns, you just want to make sure you're adding a comma after that. The other thing is you can actually do is sort by a column that you didn't retrieve. So it may not be in your select statement, but you can still use the column to sort your data, which is really helpful. The last rule is that order by must always be the last clause in the select statement. Just kind of on the finishing touches, always round it up with the adding the order by at the end. So to do this, you can sort by column position. Here at the end of my query, I have order by columns two and three in the table. Or you can even just sort it by the actual names of the column. I usually just do the names of the columns and that keeps things really consistent. If I'm looking at my products table and sort it by the products names and then by their unit price, then I would just add that in order by product names comma unit price. There are also some directions as with any type of sorting so you can sort it either in ascending, ASC, or descending order, DESC. And then this is only applied to the column name it directly precedes. If you're using order by descending and have unit price, it's not going to do it for all of the columns after the descending. You have to specify each individual columns for ascending and descending if you want it that way. So again, the idea of ordering is pretty simple concept here. But as you can see, it's really helpful in just making sure that when you're retrieving your data, you're viewing it how you want to view it, and really just getting to the core of those results. So I highly recommend and encourage you to explore and use order by to help you make sense of all of the data that you're analyzing. So I hope you've enjoyed what we've talked about so far in this course, getting data, filtering data, and so forth. But as you're probably aware, there's so much more we can actually do with our data. In this video, we're going to go over using basic math calculations with our data. After this video, you should be able to perform basic math calculations using your data, discuss in more detail the concept of the, and the order of operations, and describe what can be done in terms of analysis by using math operators and SQL together. With math calculations, we're now getting into some techniques we can use in analysis, but also be able to use these in SQL and be able to push them down to the database. As we've talked about in so many cases, the more we can push down to the database and have the processing power of the database, the better. Again, we're usually working with larger amounts of data, so we really want to reduce that strain on the client application. The closer we can do this to the source, the better we'll be in the long run. So we'll just start with some simple ones. We have the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. As you can see on the left-hand side, we have your standard operators for this. In this example, what I want to do is I want to get the total units on an order. And I want to have that times by the units price to get the total order cost. What I'll do is I'll treat this just as I would any other column that I'm retrieving. Here I have my select. I have the different columns that I'm interested in. I have my product IDs, units on the order, and unit price. And then I list out just as I would in any column, but I add in my operators. Here I have my units and order, and order times unit price. And then I'm using an alias as for what I want this new column to be named, and this is going to be the total order cost. And then I'm going to state where I want it from. As you can see, I now can retrieve four different columns, the product ID, the units on the order, the unit price, and then my new calculated column, which is the total order cost. Again, I like to bring in those other filters when I'm first calculating something, just to do a few spot checks to make sure my calculations are correct. I don't need to have the unit price and the units on the order. I could have just selected the product ID and then calculated the new field. This is just a nice little thing I like to do when I'm creating a new calculation to make sure it all adds up and looks right. 
In another example, you can start to add these operators together. And just with any math you're doing, it's going to follow your normal order of operations. You'll probably remember the order of operations from math classes you've taken in the past. The idea that things in parentheses are handled first, then powers or exponents, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. In the United States, the popular mnemonic device, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, is often used. So for this example, I'm now just going to combine division with subtraction. In parentheses, I'm just going to put what operator I want to happen first. For this, I have my unit price minus my discount divided by the quantity. And they have that listed as my total cost. Again, it just follows the same rules. You just want to list your operators in that new field calculation as you would for any other column that you're retrieving. So these are pretty simple examples, but again, really powerful when you start to add these together. Just be careful of your order of operation. Then if it's a new calculation you're doing, I would pull in the other fields in the beginning just to double check that the calculation and that you can go ahead and remove those fields later as you build your query. But it's always good to perform a safety check and make sure you're getting the results you really want. Are we having fun yet? I know I am, but it's going to get even more fun in this lesson because it's time to really take a deep dive into data analysis by going over some of the aggregate functions found in SQL. Aggregate functions provide various ways to summarize your data, which in turn really helps you to analyze your data and see what you have. In this lesson, you'll learn how to describe the various aggregate functions and what they do, explain how each of the aggregate functions can help you analyze data, Use various aggregate functions, including average, count, min, max, and sum to summarize and analyze data, and describe the use of distinct function and how it can be useful. Aggregate functions are used for all sorts of things, and they can be really helpful in finding the highest or lowest values, total number of records, average value, etc. It really builds off of some of those math operators that we have previously talked about, except they're just pre-built in functions, so it makes it super easy to start to aggregate and summarize some of your data. A lot of times in descriptive statistics, we are getting to know and understand our data. We're going to use a lot of these different types of aggregate functions. The aggregate functions we can use are average, count, min, max, and sum. And all of these are pretty self-explanatory. As you can get the average of column values, count the number of values, find the minimum and maximum value in a column, and then sum the total column values. In this example, for average, we'll use our select statement. And then just as we would list out our columns that we want to retrieve, you're going to list it out as a column you want to retrieve. But before you put your column, you're going to go in and add the function that you want. In this case, I have average because I want the average unit price. For this statement, I'm also going to add my alias to rename this column because I'm not just going to pull in the unit price. It's now the average of the unit price, and this is from the products table. Something to note here is that rows containing no or no values will be ignored by the average function. Moving on, the count function is really helpful when we want to get an idea of the contents of a table. This is just helpful to understand how many records are in a table, or how many records contain information. If you do a count with a star and brackets, you're going to count all of the rows in a table. And this could be all the values or no values because this is just counting any row in a table. You could also then count an individual column just by selecting count and then the column name. This will then count the rows for that specific column and would ignore the null values. Below we have two different examples, one where we're looking for all the records from the customer table, and then one where we're just counting the customer IDs from the customer's table. Here we may get the same results or we may get different results if there are no values in the customer ID column. Just kind of a note the differences there. You, of course, could just count one of the columns to get an overall view of the table, but then you're missing out on any null values that might not be giving you a clear picture of the full table. 
If you really want an overview of the table, use the select star count. Okay, another aggregate function we have is the min and max. This is really great. Again, you're starting to understand your data. You just got a new table. You want to see what some of this data looks like. It's always great to get a range of your data. Pulling something like what's the minimum value, what's the maximum value, starts to give you an idea of what are the distributions. And there are potential really high outliers in this data. And all of this can be done on the database. It's really helpful to do this if possible. To use this properly, we're going to put our function in a parentheses. We're going to put the column that we want it to work on, so we have select max unit price. I always do an alias because otherwise the column name will just come through as blank. And so it's helpful to remember what I was actually trying to do here. Another thing to note is that again the null values will be ignored with the min and max functions. If you are just using this function, just be aware that when the null values are ignored and when they aren't. Finally, we have the sum aggregate function. Again, you can use this in a similar fashion as with the other aggregate functions. Go ahead and state sum, the column that you want to sum, and what you want it named as, and then where you want it from. For this, we can also add these together with some of your math calculation functions. For this example, I want to look at the unit price and units in stock. I want to get a total for that, but I also want to add all of those together. Now I have the total price for all of the products with the unit price and the units in stock. Now you can see how with the math operators and some of these aggregate function, you can really start to get a better understanding of your data and now even start to do some analysis and enter your own data. Before we conclude, I want to go over one more important thing to use with aggregate functions, which is the word distinct. If the word distinct isn't specific in a statement, SQL will always assume you want all the data. For example, you may have a customer who's in a table multiple times. If you're simply doing a count on your customer IDs and you don't distinguish to count just the distinct customer IDs, you may be getting duplicate records in there. And this is really helpful to run queries where you're counting distinct and to see where there even might be some potential duplicates in a column. There are some things to keep in mind when using distinct with our aggregate function of count. You can't use distinct on the count function with the star. Just keep this in mind, not only for when and where you can use distinct, but also to think through when you want to use distinct and when you don't. Again, you're usually trying to understand your data before you're analyzing it. So performing some of these sorts of queries using aggregate functions will help you figure out what you're dealing with in a database. Congratulations, you are almost at the end of this module. We've gone over a lot of great information that not only will help you filter down your data and be really specific about what you're trying to retrieve, but also trying to perform some calculations and some aggregate functions on your data. In our previous video, we went over using aggregate functions such as average, min, max, and sum. However, one of the things we didn't go over is what you are actually aggregating those functions on. In all the examples we previously went through, what we had seen was how to pull a single field and aggregate on the single field. Well, this is helpful. A lot of times we'll be looking at the total price for something and we may want to look at it for customers or for products and we need to choose how we're going to aggregate that function. That's what this video is about. And after this lesson, you'll be able to perform some additional aggregations using group by and having clause, discuss how nulls are or aren't affected by the group by and having clauses, and how to use the group by and order by clauses together to better sort your data. Okay, let's start off with a grouping example. Let's say for this example, we want to know the number of customers we have, but we want to know this by each region. In the last lesson, we went over how to count customer IDs and to see our total number of customers. But now what we're going to do is add in that region portion. 
if we were to just have our select statement with select region, and then we have our aggregate function count customer IDs as total customers from the customers table, we're going to get an error return because we haven't specified, okay, how do you want me to count the customer IDs? That's where we add in this group by clause. We have now, after this from, we put the group by clause and what we want it to group it by. Some important things to note about the group bys is we can group it by multiple columns. We may have more columns than just region. For example, maybe we want to know region, city, country. We can list all of those in our group by clause. We will just add a comma after every column that we want listed. One of the things to note that's really important is all of the fields that you're pulling in with the aggregate function need to be in your group by clause except for the aggregated calculation. Even though you may only want to group by that region, it's going to need to be summarized by all the other columns as well. So make sure you're listing those out in order. Another thing to note is you have nulls in one of your categories, such as your region. Let's say you have the regions of California, Idaho, Texas, Nebraska, but then you also have some of the other regions that are blank. They have no values. Null will actually be grouped as its own category then. This is helpful because it helps you make sure that you're not missing any data, but it's just something to watch out for and look out for. Now that we've started to use aggregate functions and started to group them, it's also important to know how filtering with the WHERE clause works for some of these aggregates. WHERE does not work for groups because it filters on rows. Therefore, we have to use the HAVING clause when filtering with an aggregate function and grouping them. In this example, we want the count of orders for customers but we only want to see the total orders for the customers who have had more than two orders. So to do this, we're going to select our customer IDs. Then we're going to count all of the records as orders. We're going to get this from our orders table. And then since we want to look at this by each individual customer, we're going to group it by our customer ID. Then to be able to make sure we're only selecting those customers who had orders greater than or equal to two, we'll place our having clause of having count greater than or equal to two. Again, just remember that where filters before the data is grouped and then having filters after the data is grouped. Rows will be eliminated by the where clause and then those won't be included in the group by clause. This is just important to know when you should use where versus having. Both are very powerful. Both have different purposes. Just be sure to note when one is appropriate so you're not missing any data that should be counted. Another thing to note when you're working with group buys is that it's always good practice to use the order by clause. The group by does not sort the data in any fashion. It only groups it together. In our previous examples, we have a list of states, a list of regions. It's not going to sort those regions in alphabetical order. It's just going to group them by different regions. I always recommend using an order by in this sort of situation. It just makes it a little bit easier to read through your data. It's just good practice to get into. Welcome back and congratulations. You're finished with this module. We've really talked about a lot of different things in regards to filtering down our data, being specific about what we are after. We've also started to look at some math functions, some aggregate functions, and some calculations. And then we're wrapping up by thinking about how to group your data and filter it out. Now you have a lot of great statements at your disposal, and you can really use these to write some powerful queries. As you start to write more and more complex queries, always be sure to test out along the way, especially as you're doing some of these aggregates in the beginning. Test to see how many records you had before and then how many records you had after you're done aggregating. Really make sure that you're understanding what you're doing. In SQL, it's very easy to get results. So just because you can get data back doesn't mean it's the data you intended to get to, right? 
Just remember some of the pointers to why we filter in SQL before we obtain the data versus filtering out on the client application. Again, a lot of times we're doing this to increase our performance so we're not processing through as much data on the client side. But it also then helps us to understand our data. Getting really specific about the values that we're looking for, finding a range of values, finding blank values. This helps us in our descriptive statistics. Some of those aggregate functions, such as looking at the min, max of things, and this can really help us understand our data and what's going on. Now that you have learned a few different clauses that you can use with your select statement, I think it's good just to keep in reference the formal structure of it. Prior to this, we talked about selecting data and getting it from somewhere. Now we've added up a couple different clauses and it's important to remember the order that these go in. And I've just listed these out in order here, starting with the select. So again, we're always going to have that select statement at the beginning. We're going to say where we're getting it from, and then we're going to be using our where clause if we need to do any row level filtering. Again, if we have an aggregate function in our select statement, we'll want to make sure we're, we're including that group by clause. Then if we have the group by, we may want to do some grouping and level filtering. So we'll be needing that having clause. Order by is always our last thing that we put in our query. And this is just going to sort the order of things in any way that you determine. You can see on the right hand side, I've listed out whether or not the statement is required. Some of these you can see, they aren't always required. This just gives you a really nice structured outline for a lot of the common statements and clauses you'll be using and the order that they should be in when writing SQL statements. Now at this point, you should have plenty to get you started. I hope you have a lot of fun playing around with some of these different aggregate functions, filtering down your data and seeing how it changes. All right, go out there and give it a try. Things are starting to really heat up for us now with SQL because we're finally getting to a point where we're going to be able to use multiple tables together. Up until this point, we've just been working with a single table and we've learned how to do some cool things. We can get lots of data returned. We can perform some calculations on it, but we're still really limited in terms of what we can do because we're only using one table. And where we get a lot of value in relational databases is when we combine different facts, dimensions, and sources together to obtain new meaning. One of the easiest ways to do that is with something called subqueries, which is what we're going to focus on in this lesson. After this video, you should be able to define subqueries, discuss advantages and disadvantages to using subqueries, explain how using subqueries can help us merge data from two or more tables together, and write efficient subqueries to make your data analysis smoother. So to begin, let's define subqueries. In essence, subqueries are queries embedded into other queries. It's literally just a query inside another query. So far, we've only worked with a single select statement and a single table. But when you're working with a relational database, since data is stored in multiple tables, you may need to merge these together or get information from multiple sources. Data scientists often use subqueries to select specific records or columns and then use that criteria as a filtering criteria for the next thing they want to select. Not only are subqueries helpful when it comes to getting information from multiple tables, but they're often used for adding additional criteria like filtering criteria that's not in your current table from another table into your query. Let's look at another example of this. Let's say we want to know the region each customer is from who has had an order with freight over 100. Maybe we're wanting to look at our shipping costs and say, who's really had heavy freight and where are these coming from? If we did this with the normal method we have right now, since this information is in two different tables, the customer table and the orders table, we would have to first retrieve all of the customer IDs for orders with freight over 100. But then we wouldn't have what region the customer is from because that's in a different table, the orders tables in this case. Then I would have to go and retrieve the customer information to get the regions from that separate table. 
And then I would need to combine that so now I can select the IDs for the ones that had freight over 100. Clearly, this is quite a few steps, and we always want to limit these and make things as simple as possible in SQL. In this example again, you can see we pulled our customer IDs where freight is over 100. To do another query, to get my company name from my customer's region, and then now combine the list of those customer IDs into my other query, which had my customer information. This is also taxing right now because I just had a few customer IDs. So I could just say where a customer ID is this. Because I've already pre-qualified this as being over 100 in freight. If that was a large list, this would be very taxing when either trying to find a way to manually copy and paste in, or also computationally for it to go through each one and match it. So to avoid this mess in SQL, we write what are called subqueries. We can take the three queries we had to write to do the job and instead combine all three queries into one larger query in order to make things more efficient. What I usually do when writing a subquery is start with the innermost query. How we're using this query is to filter for customers that we're getting back. My filtering criteria in this example is to find records where the freight is over 100. I'm first going to take that first query I wrote, which is to select the customer IDs from orders where freight is over 100. And that's going to be my main base. I'm going to filter down to that, and then I'm going to go and expand and add on to it. This is your innermost query. From there, I'm going to write the query to select my customer IDs, my company name, my region to get my region information. I'm going to get that from inside the customer table. Where now I can connect the subquery and my customer information query together is using the WHERE clause. When I say is WHERE the customer ID is in the SELECT statement, remember we're using this kind as a filtering criteria. It's saying only to return the region, company name, and customer ID for those customer IDs that are in this other select statement. A good way to think about this is that the query statement is always going to go perform the innermost select portion first. It's going to say, okay, I've got the customer IDs where the freight's over 100, and then it's going to sit there with them. Then it's going to go and go through to bring in the customer ID, company name, and region, but it's going to match to the customer IDs up against the list it pulled earlier to see if the customer IDs are actually in there. Then it's only going to return those customer IDs that were actually in that list of the select statement. You can see this helps reduce the number of queries we have to write, and it also helps keep everything concise in one query. Two things to remember about this in the innermost query is it's always what is performed first. If I'm looking at somebody's query and trying to troubleshoot it, I always start with the innermost query to see what's going on, and then slowly from there build and work backwards. In this example, remember the database is really performing two operations. One, it's getting our customer IDs with the criteria fray over 100, then it's going and pulling the other customer information and matching it up against the customer IDs we've already pre-selected. Okay, this is a good place to stop for now. You know all of the basics with subqueries. What they are, when they're advantageous, how they help us when combining data from multiple tables, and how to write them effectively. Keep all of this in mind because we're going to be using subqueries a whole lot more from here on out. Welcome back! So in our last lesson, we started a discussion about subqueries, and we're going to continue that discussion here by discussing a few notes on best practices with subqueries. After this particular video, you should be able to discuss how to write a subquery within a subquery within a subquery, you get the idea, discuss some performance limitations with the overuse of subqueries, explain how to use subqueries as calculation, Describe some great general best practices when using subqueries. Okay, to begin with, 
One of the things you'll note is that there's no limit to the number of subqueries you can have in a statement. You can have a query inside a query, inside a query, inside a query, and just keep querying until your heart's content. However, you will start to notice that performance in obtaining your results does slow down as you get deeply nested and write long query statements with a bunch of subqueries. One thing to note is that sub Query selects can only retrieve a single column. You can't say, hey, go select all these columns from this table and then bring them in my overall query. It's only going to select a single column at a time. Again, this is why they're used in filtering a lot. As you can see, this is just an example here of subqueries in a subquery. We have three different queries here. This one is nicely indented, so it's a little bit easier to read, which is a good practice because if everything was just lined up, you could get lost very easily, and it's hard to see where you're at and where things are coming from and what's happening. One of the things that's really important when you're working with subqueries is to make sure you're properly indenting things. This is going to really help make it easy for you and others to read. Here's an example you can see when I removed it from the indention, and it's really hard to see what we're doing here, where things are starting and where things are ending. So if you're writing subqueries, make sure that each select statement is indenting and starting on its own. A helpful website for this is Poor SQL. If you're getting something from an application that generates SQL and they're just really difficult to read because they aren't automatically indented, I always just throw it into this website and it pre-formats it, indenting things properly so I can easily interpret it. It, help make, it helps makes it a lot easier to read. Then if you're writing them, just be really clear and consistent in your indenting with your queries. This will make it a lot easier for not only you, but for someone else to read. When you or they are troubleshooting a particularly complex query. Okay, just one more example of subqueries. Subqueries can also be used as calculations. In this example, we want to get the company name and the region, and we want a total number of orders for these customers. Before writing the subquery, we, what we could do is we could count the number of orders for a particular customer ID, but then we still wouldn't have the customer name and region information. Instead of doing something where we're trying to combine these two together, we're just going to write a subquery. And instead of using the subquery with the WHERE clause, this is actually one of the columns we're selecting. As you can see, we're selecting company name. We're selecting the region, and then just as if we were going to select a different column name, we have our whole subquery in there. We have select count as orders from orders. And then what we're saying is we want to count these based on the customer IDs. It's aggregating the orders based on the customer IDs. This is saying where the order customer ID equals the customer's customer ID. This is coming from the orders table, and we're matching it up to our WHERE query through the FROM of the customers table and the customer ID. Then we just close our subquery in brackets and finish our SELECT statement. We're getting this from customers, and we just want order by the company name. Now you can see we have our customer's company name, we have the region they're from, and then we have the total orders for that. In this example, you can see it just treats it like another additional column, but really helpful when you're wanting to do some calculations and do a calculated fill on another table. Okay, so to sum up, remember, subqueries are very powerful, but consider their use very carefully, because it may not always be the best thing to use for performance reasons. There's a lot of other ways we can get the result and not have to use subqueries. For example, later in this course, we're going to talk about joins, how we use them and what they're for. But it's important to know what subqueries are and how they fit into the grand scheme of things. This is just one of many techniques we can use to start to combine information together from multiple tables. 
We will continue on with some additional ways to combine data in the next few videos. Hello, and welcome back. In our previous couple of videos, we began to introduce some ways in which you can bind information from multiple tables, primarily by using subqueries. As we learned, though, due to some limitations, subqueries aren't always the best way to combine information. In this video, we're going to begin to go over joins, another very popular method for combining data from multiple tables together. After this lesson, you'll be able to discuss the benefits of relational database systems, describe what a join is and how to use the join function to combine information from multiple tables, and describe how a key field is used to link data together. So before we start to talk about joins and why we use them, let's do a quick recap on relational databases and why we use them. Remember how we talked earlier in the course about how understanding the database and how they relate to each other is a really important in terms of writing your queries? Well, I think you're really going to start to see why when we start joining tables together. Until very recently, we've just been working off a single table, and we've been able to perform a lot of functions and get data. But more often than not, the data we're after is stored in multiple tables. And so that poses a problem when we want to bring all this data together to blend it into analysis that we need. And then there's some reasons that we store the data in multiple tables. One of these is that it just breaks down the data for more efficient storage. So if we have an individual record of someone and instead of breaking it up between maybe consumer demographics and then the products that they ordered and had all the information in one table, we would have duplicate information within a record. So the orders that they make may change, but something like their location may not change as frequently. So when we split out the information into separate tables, it helps us to more efficiently store the data that we have, so we're not duplicating records. This also makes it a lot easier to manipulate the data so when we want to update a record or change something, when that data isn't touching all different levels, it's a lot easier to manipulate. This allows us the opportunity to scale the information. So there's a lot of reasons why breaking down the data into different tables is beneficial. But how we break the data down into tables is often modeled after a business problem or business process. So remember, we talked about this in terms of data modeling and our relational databases. A lot of times, we'll take the tables and then reduce them in a way that has its own kind of theme or process. And then to get the data to come together, we use keys. This helps us so we don't have to duplicate the data in multiple tables. We're able to join those tables together based on an individually unique key. So this key serves as a link between the tables, and this key is a critical piece to being able to join records and tables together. So the first thing we want to go over with joins is that these joins are what associate the correct records from each table on the fly. To help explain this, again, we'll go back to our example of you have a table that lists the different customer demographics but you want to know all of the orders that the customer has made. So a join will allow you to associate the correct customer information with the correct order quickly and on the fly with your query. This also allows you to retrieve the data from multiple tables in just one query. So instead of what you've seen in the past, and the reasons why you do subqueries instead of going and grabbing a portion from one table and then a portion from another table and then trying to merge that information together. Instead, this allows you to write it all in one query and easily bring data from multiple sources together. It's important to note that a join is not a physical entity. In other words, it doesn't create anything permanent. It only exists for the duration of the query execution to help you get that information you're trying to get. Now there are several types of joins, and we're going to go over some of the important ones beginning with the next video. But let's stop here and reflect on what we've learned about joins so far. 
we began with a review of relational database systems and discussed how multiple tables are useful and efficient for storing data. We introduced the concept of a join and how it's used to combine information from multiple tables into one query. And we wrapped up by talking about how keys help us do this. Don't worry, there's more to come. Welcome back. So now that we understand the basics of join as a concept, it's time to explore the different kinds of joins and how to use them. The first join we're going to go over is called the Cartesian join, which is also often referred to as the cross join. After this video, you'll know all about Cartesian joins because you'll be able to define Cartesian joins, describe some specific cases on when Cartesian joins are useful, and write the appropriate syntax to establish a cross join using SQL. So to begin, with the Cartesian join, this allows you to take each record from the first table and match it with all of the records from the second table. So a way to think of this is the first table contains X rows and the second table contains Y rows. You'll have the end result of X times Y. So as you might guess, this is computationally taxing because if you have a table with just 10 records in it and the second table with 10 records, just performing a cross join is already going to increase it to 100. And rarely are you ever working with a table with just 10 records. So these aren't frequently used, but they're helpful in specific cases. So how do we write this out and what is the syntax for this? you're going to write your SELECT statement, the first part, just like any other SELECT statement. So we'll have our SELECT, the columns that we want, and this will be going over the product name, the unit price that's from the products table, and then the company name from the suppliers table. So you'll notice I just listed out the columns that I wanted. Even though they are from two separate tables, and then I'm going to list from suppliers where it's coming from. But it's also coming from products, so I'll list out from products as well. But in between that, I want to state the type of join I want to do. So for this, I have just stated from suppliers and then cross join with products. So this, because we are just saying, hey, times every record in the first table by the number in the second table, we don't need any key or qualification, right? So is no matching being done? So this is a very simple join that you can do. However, just be careful because it's not matching on anything, right? It's just simply multiplying what you had in the first table and multiplying those records with what's in the second table. So in this example, in our suppliers, in our products, we had 29 records in one table and 77 in the other table, and then our end result is 2,233 records. What we also have is the supplier name is with the product name and price. You can see that from the from clause listed the two different tables, and then we just instructed it on the type of join we wanted it to have. So again, a really simple join with these cross joins. However, just be careful in understanding why you're using them and when you're using them. One of the reasons I mentioned before, the cross join and Cartesian joins are very computationally taxing. You can see how quickly this can increase the size of your data, and it also has the potential to return incorrect results, right? We're not matching it on anything. It's just taking one table and multiplying it by the other. So really be conscious and aware of what you're doing when you're using the Cartesian or cross joins. All right, are you ready for some more joins? Great, because in this lesson, we're going to go over probably one of the most frequently used joins in SQL called the inner join. After this lesson, you'll know how to define and describe an inner join, explain when an inner join is used, as well as how to pre-qualify column names to make your SQL code 
that much more cleaner and efficient. Are you ready to get going? Great, so let's begin. So an inner join is used to select records that have matching values in both tables. So this is where keys become really important in tables. As you can see by the diagram here, we have table one and table two, and what is going to return is only the records that are matching in both. So it's going to look for that key in that link, and even if there's more records in table one, it's not going to bring those back. It's just going to bring back the matches. How we start to use this though is a little bit different in terms of the syntax. So again, we're still listing out the columns that we want from both tables. So we have our select, our company name, our product name, or unit price. But now instead of just saying, go and grab the data from suppliers and products, we also have to say how we want the tables to be linked. So we say grab it from suppliers, the type of join we're going to do, inner join, with products, and then what, we're, what you're listing is really that key. So we're saying is this is an inner join and we want you to link it on the connection between the key. So the connection between the key, the two tables is the supplier ID in the suppliers table and the supplier ID in the products table. So you'll notice, as I say here, that supplier ID equals supplier ID, but before that, I've listed, I pre-qualified which supplier ID. So I have the supplier IDs from the suppliers table that equals the supplier IDs from the products table. So one thing to note here with this pre-qualifying is that if this is pre-qualified as suppliers and I have another name in here that is also in the same table, I want to pre-qualify my name in my column. So if company name is something that was listed both in products and in suppliers, it wouldn't know which table to pull it from. So I would pre-qualify it by listing out suppliers before the company name like this so that I would know for sure where to pull it from. Okay, so this is the inner join. We really just keep a lot of the same syntax in listing the two tables. What we've done differently though, is we've added that link of what we're joining on and pre-qualified that. Now you can see the result that we get from this. This is now connecting only those products that had a matching supplier with them. We can though, do inner joins on multiple tables. So in the last example, we just took two tables and said, which records are matching? However, we can perform this on multiple tables. However, one thing I would really be cautious against though, is to be careful to not overly join. So joins are great, and they make it super easy to blend your data together. All you need is that key, but they are taxing in the computations that they're performing. So if you don't need a join, don't join. But the good news is there are no limits to what you can join. So to do this, you're just going to list out all the tables and define the condition. Here though, because I have multiple tables, it's really important that I'm pre-qualifying my names. So if you look in my from statement, I have orders and then I just list O. So I'm pre-qualifying the orders table as being O. I do this just because it's a little bit quicker to write out. You could just pre-qualify orders as orders. Some other people list out their tables where they say orders would be A, customers would be B, employees would be C. I get a little confused and don't remember sometimes the order in which I put them in. So the way I like to pre-qualify is the less I have to type the better. But I also want it to usually be in a logical fashion just because it's a little bit easier to follow if I don't remember which one it's coming from. So I have orders as O, customers as C, and employees as E. It's just an easy way then for me to remember. You can now see in my select statement, I pre-qualified all the column names, and this is just something good to get into. You never know if you don't know your data that well, you don't know if the same column name resides in another table. 
So being really specific about which table you want it to come from is always a good idea. And it's just a nice best practice to get into. So here I have selected O, order ID, C, company name, and E for employee last name. So I'm wanting to get here the last name of the employees and the company name with the orders that were placed for this. So for this, I need to join three different tables to do that. I'm going to say from, and I have my orders with an inner join on customers, and that's going to be joined by the customer ID. Again, you can see that I just listed out my pre-qualified name with o.customerid and c.customerid. So now, at this point, I have enough to get my order ID and my company name. So right now, I know at least the orders that were placed and the customers that placed them. Now I want to know the employees associated with those orders. So just after that statement, I list to do another inner join. This will be for the employees E table. And I'm going to join that to the orders through the employee ID. So I have O.EmployeeID, so that's coming the link from orders to employee, and that is equal to E.EmployeeID. So that's the employee ID in the employees table. So pretty simple in terms of adding additional tables on. The thing you just want to watch out for is making sure you're pre-qualifying your names and making sure that you aren't doing unnecessary joins. But the thing to be really careful about is that it's easy to make a join and get data return, but really make sure you're thinking about what is the type of join you're doing. How are you connecting these records? And we'll talk a little bit later about some things you can do to double check to make sure the number of records is the number that you were after and the number you want. Because like we've seen in a lot of cases with using SQL, you're often able to get data back with any structured query. But we really want to make sure it's the right data that we want in the first place. Okay. So in the next few videos, to wrap up the module, we'll just be going over some more features with joins and we'll be up and running with combining multiple tables here soon. Stay tuned. Welcome. In our last video, we talked about qualifying your table names. And so we've touched on this briefly, but I just want to go into it a little bit more detail in regards to using table aliases. We've used aliases when we are aggregating a field, so if we're taking the average selling price, we'll oftentimes create an alias for that so we know what to call the name. We can do a similar thing when we're using tables and joining tables together. And why we do this is because it makes it a lot easier to read and write. If we are joining two tables together and we need to state where each individual column is from before we state that column, it can be a lot to write out an alias, as some of the table names may be quite long. So in this video, we're going to show you how to create aliases for use in our queries, discuss some common naming conventions when using aliases, and discuss and establish self-joins within a SQL database. So an alias is helpful because it can help you by just shortening names and simplifying how we're pre-qualifying them. Then something nice about the alias is, it's not rewriting the name of the table or rewriting anything. It's just only stored for that duration of the query. So an example of this is in the query example. We have some information we're pulling from vendors and products. And so before every item that we're pulling, we're listing out its vendor name, where it's coming from, and the product name, product price. We're listing the name of the table before we're pulling that column name. Then we also have the same thing on our join. We're seeing where are the vendors for vendor ID goes and the products for, for the vendor ID. We start to use the aliases. What happens is it simplifies what we're writing quite a bit. So instead of having vendor name, all we have is V and then the name 
or instead of having product and then the name, all we have is P and then the name. Same thing with price. Instead of having product price, we just have P price. To qualify this or create the alias, we do this when we're saying when we're getting the table. When we're getting it from vendors, we're going to say vendors is going to be V and then products is P. Again, you can make these aliases as anything you want. Like I said earlier in the course, some people like to do A, B, C, D, but I like to keep it in a logical fashion. Some people also like to abbreviate the names of a, a little bit. So instead of maybe using V, it'd be V-E-N for vendor or P-R-O-D for products. It's really up to you. This is what I found helpful, so you're welcome to use that, but do what suits you. Then you can see in our WHERE clause, it also simplifies that as well. So instead of fully writing out vendor or product ID, we just use the V and the P again. Again, just a really helpful little tip you can do. You can always write it as V or just do vendor as V. And that will also help when pre-qualifying in most database management systems. Okay, so back to joins. We can actually join a table to itself. And perhaps not surprisingly, these are called self-joins. In this instance, what we're going to do is we're going to match customers that are from the same city. We have all of our customers listed out in the table and where they're from. But we want to match these, so we're going to take the table and almost treat them as two separate tables and join the original table to itself. To do this, what it's going to have to take is you'll have your select statement, you'll have your column names, and then what you're going to do is when you list where it's coming from, you're going to qualify table name one as table name one, and then table name two as table name two. So if we look at this in our example, we have select our company name, and that's gonna be company one. We're qualifying that. Then we're going to select company name again as company name two. And when we're going to select the city that we want this from. To get these tables, we are listing out the same table customers two times, but you can see we're qualifying it in two different ways. So first it's customers is A, and then the second time it's customers as B. To do this then, and to join on itself, we're going to say where a.customerID equals b.customerID and city a.city equals b.city. And then just to make it easier to read, we will order by a.city. So this is a great example why table aliases are so important, especially when you're joining a table to itself. You have to have a table alias. There's no other way this could happen but also they really help you to stay clear on what's coming from what. So this is a really helpful method when you want to match certain elements that are in the same table and it's a great tool to have in your toolbox for SQL. Okay, that does it for this lesson. So buckle up because we have some more joins coming at you in our next video. All right, so if you're keeping count at home, We've gone over two important joins so far, and in this video, we're going to go over a few other core joins, including the left join, the right join, a full outer join. However, before we get started, I just want you to note that only the left join is available in SQLite, which as you know, is what we're using in this course. The right and full outer joins are definitely found in other database management systems, which is why we'll go over them in this video as well. After watching this video, you should be able to explain how a left join, right join, and full outer join work, identify situations where it makes sense to use one join over another, and use these joins to combine data from multiple tables. Okay, we're going to start with the left join. First, because it's pretty universal to most database management systems, including SQLite, so the easiest way to understand what a left join is going to do is to look at the picture and the diagram here. 
the left join is going to return all the records from the table on the left side. So the table you first state and the matching records with the second table. So if you look at the customers you had who had an order, and let's say you have a customer who has given you their information, but they haven't placed an order. And so if you did an inner join on a table one, which was customers, and table two, which was orders, and you did an inner join, you'd be missing the customers who haven't placed an order. So what this is going to do is it's going to allow you to say, hey, I still want everything from the customer table. I don't care if they didn't have an order, but if they did, and then bring it also all together and bring it in in one order table. So that's the left join. The right join is very similar, except in this instance, if we still stick with customers tables is on the left and orders is on the right, what this would do is pull in all the orders whether or not a customer is associated with that order or not. And then, for the ones that do have a customer most associated with it, it would pull in those records as well. So a little bit different. Really be careful if you're using left and right joins and which table you're listing as coming first and make sure that relates to the left or right in the type of the join you use. For the full outer join, this will return all the records where there is a match in either table one or there's a match in table two. So this is just saying, hey, just return and give me everything, whether there's matching one or matching two. So we'll go into a little bit more detail about these joins. We'll use these frequently, so we'll want to make sure we really understand them. The first one is, let's say, again, we're talking about customers who have an order, right? So this one, we want to get a list of all those customers, whether or not they had an order. And if they did have an order, we want that information as well. So we just want our company name from the customers, the order ID, and then we'll say where it's from customers, which we're pre-qualifying as C. We're going to do a left join to the orders table, which is O. And then again, our link is that which is on C.CustomerID equals O.CustomerID. So this is really what's pulling it together in the middle section. But what you'll notice is what we listed out as first. So we're going to be getting back all the customers because we're doing a left join and that's what we have listed first. So go ahead and play with this. This would be really fun when you're experimenting. Look and see what you get back when you list the customers first versus the orders first. And that's a good way to test your join and see what's happening. Depending on your data, every customer may have an order. So you may get the same results. But maybe every customer doesn't have an order. So again, it all comes to knowing and understanding the data you're working with. So for the right join, what we're looking for in this is we want to return a statement with employees and orders that the employees may be associated with. So for this, again, I'm pre-qualifying my names, except I'm not pre-qualifying it in this instance as O. I'm listing them fully out. So you can see how it gets a little bit longer in what I'm writing. I'm just going back and forth and showing you the different ways to do this, but still getting the same results. So I have my columns right after my order ID, last name, and first name. I'm getting this from the orders table, and then I'm going to right join the employees on orders. And this is going to be on the same employee ID from the orders table equals the employee ID from the employees table. So you might ask yourself is, well, couldn't I have done the same thing and done a left join, but just switched up the order of the tables? And so instead of saying I want a right join where I'm getting all the employees back, whether I could have had where they could have had a match or not, I could have just listed the employees first and done a left join. And this is true, so good thinking. I'm glad you are paying attention. This is 100% true. 
you can just switch the order of that. And that is why it's not a big deal that SQLite does not support the right joins, because if you need to do this type of join, you can just switch the order of the tables and do a left join. But still, it's something to be aware of in case you come across it in other queries that you might be reading or using from a different relational database management system. So you'll be able to use it. Okay, so now the full outer join. Again, this is not supported by SQLite, which we'll be using, but I just want to touch on it briefly in case this is something that you come across in a different database management system. In this example, the select statement is going to select all the customers and all orders. For this, again, we pre-qualify our column names. We say where we're getting it from. We're getting it from the customers table. We say the type of join we're doing, full outer join to the orders, and then we list what we're joining it on. Again, it all follows a similar syntax. Just be aware of the type of join that you're using. So that's our more advanced joins, left, right, full outer joins. They all have their particular use cases. Just be careful when you're using them in the way you intend to in order to get the results that you expect. We have one more important, though seldom used, join to talk about, and we're going to cover that in the next video. See you there! Hi there! So by now you might be all joined out, because we've covered a lot of different joins of this module. But there is one more that I want to go over with you, and that's called the union. The union is one of those things that I wouldn't say I use a lot in my day-to-day -day work, but when I do need it, I'm like, yes, this is exactly the thing I need to use to get the job done. So I think it's useful to go over it. It's kind of like a secret weapon. It probably won't be your go-to, but you're certainly not going to, and you're certainly not going to use it every day. But when you do need it, it's going to save you a lot of time. All right. So after this video, you'll be able to, to describe what a union does and how it does it, discuss the parameters and rules for when you can employ a union, write out the appropriate syntax for a proper union statement, and describe some common situations where it could be useful. Okay, so to begin, a union is used to combine the results of two or more queries or table sets into one table and one statement. So each select statement gets union with each other and kind of stacked on top of each other. The best way I can think of this is when I may ask someone to build me a building that's 20 story tall and I have two people to build it, so I may ask the first person to build the first 10 floors and the second person to build the top 10 floors. So that's great. Both of them can work independently from each other, but at the same point, I want to put these two back together. And so it's really important to know where the stairs are at, how wide or long the building is, to make sure that everything's the same size and can fit back together. It's kind of similar with the union. So you have two separate pieces, two separate tables or queries, and you're literally going to just stack them on top of each other. So to do this, you must have the same number of columns, right? Going back to our metaphor, the building needs to be the same size, and you must also have similar types of data. So you can't just throw an integer on top of a string. The data types need to be the same, and if there weren't enough then I also want to make sure the columns are in the same order. So I want to make sure my whole building is the same size, and I want to make sure that the floor plans look similar. But if I put the stairs on the west side in one building, and then the east side on the other building, that's not going to work out very well. So you also want to make sure your columns are all arranged in the same order. Okay, let's look at an example. What we're going to do is select customers from Germany, and we want what cities in Germany our customers are from. We also then want to know what cities we have suppliers in. And so what we're going to do is where we're going to write two separate queries. One to get what cities from the customers and then the cities from the suppliers. And then we're going to add those together so we know where we have a presence, whether it's by customer 
or by supplier. So the syntax for this is you have your select statement with your column names from your table, and then you list where the union, and then you also have your second select statement. So this is different in fact that most of the joins we've been doing up to this point, we have our whole select statement. We say where and how we want it join. This we say our select statement, we say our join, and then we say the other statement that's going to stack. So in our example here, what we have is our first statement. So we're selecting city and country from customers table where the country equals Germany. So for this, we don't have to have the where clause, but we just want to limit to Germany. Then in our second statement, we're going to first say union, and then we're going to write our second statement. So now we're selecting cities and countries, but from the suppliers table. Again, we want just the countries of Germany, and we're going to order these by the city name. So now we have a list. Maybe this is something we want to plot on a map for a marketing to say, hey, look, we have business relations with all these cities in Germany. And so we're classifying our business relations as both customer relations and supplier relations. And so now we have a really nice list that we could go and plot on a map. Somewhere to say where all our customers are and list our business relationships out. So that, in a nutshell, is a union. You should now have a good idea of what it is, how the tables need to be constructed for it to work properly, how to use it in a select statement, and a situation or two where it might prove very useful to you. Again, this isn't an operator I use every day, but I use it enough that I think it's handy for you to know. Congratulations, you've finished another module. So joins are pretty simple concepts but they're really powerful, right? So now we've just expanded what data we're able to pull by however many tables we have, especially if we have a unique key linking them together. So now our queries can start to get really complex because of the number of fields we're going after and how rapidly they've increased. Again, as we've always said with SQL, probably one of the hardest parts about it is that it's easy to get results. You just need to be sure you're getting the results that you want. Now that you're joining data, you don't want to see what is happening to every record or how it's matching. So you need to make sure you're going through and checking your results. If you're doing a Cartesian join, check the number of records in the first table and the second table and multiply them to make sure it's the intended outcome. If you're doing a left join and you know how many records are in the left table, Make sure that's the number of records that you are getting back in your results. Everything's going to be brought over from the left table. Another thing to do is check for duplicates. So unless you said something where you're doing a union and you don't care if there's duplicates, check and see if somehow your join got messed up and there's duplicates. So let's go over a few quick things you can do to start to make sure that our joins are working well. One, check the number of records you have each time you make a new join. Did you lose any records? Did you gain any records you weren't expecting? And then the other thing is to look for duplicates. So as you start to join more and more tables together, it's going to get more complex. So really start small. Start with just one table. Check it and add another table. Check it and move on from there. As I said before, the most important thing I can teach you in this class is to slowly do. So I know it's so easy to get in and you want to write the query and pull some data, but it will definitely benefit you in the long run and you're gonna get a lot further ahead if you stop and think about what you're doing first. So even if you just need to draw the two tables and draw how they're joining together in a picture, that can help a lot. Just taking the time to slowly think through what you're trying to do will be really helpful. I encourage you to actually think about what's actually happening in the query. Determine how these records are going to be merged before you actually even sit down and write the query at all. Even though you might think that you should be writing, typing, and putting in code, I promise you, 
taking the time to really think about things through will save you a ton of time and frustration in the long run. So another thing to remember is always with the joins, you'll need to use a join condition. So unless you're doing a Cartesian join or unions, but the inner joins, the left joins, and the right joins, those will all need a join condition. Usually you'll be working with inner join. However, be sure to understand all of them because you never know when you'll need that secret weapon in your arsenal. Another thing to remember is the more tables you join, the worse your performance is going to get. So again, it's easy. Just say, go get me all the data. I'm going to use it all for my analysis. Resist that urge and think strategically about your analysis. Don't grab unnecessary data if you don't need it. Why go through all the pain of moving it if you really don't need it? So think strategically about the data you need. As in life, only take what you need. Don't take more, don't take less. It's just a good habit to get into. And then lastly, the syntax for some of these joins may be a little bit different based on your database management system. Most of these joins, except for the right and full outer join, should work with SQLite, which we're using in this class. But if you're using something different at work, just keep that in mind. So there's a lot of different diagrams you can find on SQL joins. I think if you just Google SQL joins, there's a lot of ones that will come up. I really like these because it provides a visual to help me kind of remember, okay, what's coming from what table? What's matching? And where are they coming from? Are all the rows coming? What's happening? So this is just a nice little diagram. I think it's helpful for you as you're writing your queries. And feel free to print it out. Keep it by your desk as you're getting started. But it really just kind of goes through and shows the differences between all the joins and what's happening there. OK, you should now be all set as far as joining goes. I hope you're excited. Like I said, the data you can now work at with has expanded dramatically. Just remember and think about what you're doing. Really put together kind of what's happening. Either write it out on a piece of paper just to break some of the abstraction down before starting to write your queries, but get in there and practice and you'll be getting the data you want back for your analysis in no time. Data scientists often have to integrate and harmonize data from a variety of sources, and the data that you're integrating isn't always formatted in the same way. This can obviously cause problems when you're trying to blend this data together. Knowing a few tricks and how to change the fields you're looking at, whether it's a string or date, is very useful to know as you start to learn to combine data from multiple sources together. Over the next few lessons, we're going to go through a few ways that you can start to manipulate the data in order to blend it to make it work for your analysis. In this video specifically, we're going to talk about things you can do with text strings. At the end of this lesson, you'll be able to concatenate or combine text strings together, trim text strings, use the substring function, and change the case of your strings. All right, so let's begin. Strings are really important because we're going to encounter them a lot in text and categorical data. Strings pop up everywhere and are pieces of data we frequently work with. It's important, as we've discussed before, to retrieve the data in the format you need. So if there's something that you can process and do on the server versus your client application you're working with, then it's best to go ahead and do it there on the server. SQL supports a couple of different string functions. It can concatenate, which is a fancy data science word for linking things together. It can use substrings, or SQL can trim the beginning and end of the string. So let's discuss a few examples to learn these various functions. Let's go over concatenating something first. This function is really helpful when you're coming up with a unique ID for something. Maybe you want to concatenate the first couple letters of a person's first name and the first couple letters of the last name. Or maybe you just want a unique category or field. To do this, we're going to do is use the pipe or vertical bar key. 
on most keyboards in the US, this is a typically right above the backslash key and is usually accessible by holding shift when hitting this key. In this example, I want to concatenate the company name and the contact name. What I've done is I've used my select statement and I have pulled apart the company name and added to it the contact name. You can see I called the company name here. Then I use the pipe to indicate that I want to concatenate and then in parentheses I indicate what I want company name to concatenate with. In this case, it's contact name. Here in this example, you can see I pulled in the company name and the contact name just so you can see them individually. Then you can see on this side the ultimate re result from the concatenation. It's important to know that the different relational database management systems use different formatting than this. SQL Server, for example, uses the plus sign instead of a pipe. Just be sure to look this up based on the type of application you're using. The next thing we're going to look at is trimming our strings. With this function, you can either trim everything off the front and the back, or you can just trim it from the right or left. To do this, we're going to use the simple function called trim. We also have rtrim and ltrim for right trim and left trim, respectively. Here, you can see my string is the thing that says, you the best. And there's trailing spaces before and after that. When I put it in parentheses and I have called the trim function before it, we can see that the end result takes care of all of the trailing spaces. This is just a really easy way to clean up your data, and that will save you a lot of hassle in the long run. Finally, we're going to work with the substring. Substring is a useful function that allows you to pull apart just a portion of the string that you're looking at. Again, we talked about creating multiple unique IDs. Or maybe you want to combine the first couple letters of somebody's name with the last few, or you're just trying to shorten a name because you only have so much space for it. If you use the function sub str, it's going to return a specific number of characters for a particular position in the string. You can designate where you want it to start and where you want it to end. How this works is you write out the function sub str. The first thing you're going to give this function is the string name. So where do you want it to pull it from? And then you want to say where is the string position? So that's what's the string starting position. Then, what are the number of characters that you want return? In this example, I'm going to look at the first name. Then I'm going to have my substring start at the third character, and I want it to pull four characters starting there. As you can see in the first example with Nancy, there aren't four characters. It just gives me whatever it can fill in with it. Then you can see where it starts. It didn't give me the N or the A. It started with the second N and then gave me this, N-C-Y. The name Andrew is a little bit better example because I can see all four characters that I'm getting. But then if you go down to number nine, you can see that with Anne, I'm only going to be getting two characters. Another example of this is, again, if we wanted to just pull the first three characters of a person's name. Say I want it from first name, and I'm going to start with the first character and go all the way through the third character. Finally, let's wrap up this lesson with one more quick way to clean up your data. Sometimes strings need to have their case changed. You'll get into this information with the free form fields or people's names. What happens is, some people use all caps, or some people will capitalize their first name. It gets messy. Just to standardize your data and make it so that you can do comparisons or blend it with another field, it's really helpful to change everything to either upper or lower case. For this, again, it's just a simple function. You're going to say upper and then the column name that you want to change to uppercase. An alternative function that does the same thing is ucase. Then to convert strings to lowercase, you can use the function lower. Okay, we've covered a lot in this lesson, so let's stop here. You should now know how to concatenate and trim strings, 
use the substring function to get a portion of a string, and how to change a string's case when necessary. In our next few lessons, we're going to continue our discussion of data manipulation, and we're going to move on to talk about date and time strings. Welcome back. In our last lesson, we learned about many things you can do with strings. We're going to continue that discussion here by looking at a particular type of string, dates. Date variables are tricky and can be difficult to work with because they can be stored and formatted in many different ways. But dates are something that we use in analysis often. And as such, you're having to restructure this type of data frequently. We also use dates for different time series analysis, and the time frame of the date you're looking at can be really important if you're doing any sort of clustering with your data. After this lesson, you should be able to describe the complexities of adjusting date and time strings, discuss some of the different formats in which dates and times are present, list and describe the five different functions in SQL that can be used to manipulate date and time strings. Let's begin. Working with dates is an important skill to have, but it is also one of the more difficult things when it comes to working with SQL and databases. One of the things to note, again, is each data management system uses its own variety of data type. Again, you should probably look it up and see what are frequently used ones and which systems you're using. For this, I'm going to be specifically going over SQLite, since that's what we're using in this class. But again, just remember to pay attention to this in case you're using a different database management system for your job. One of the things to remember here is, as long as your data contains only the date portion, your queries will work as expected. However, if there is a time portion involved, it starts to get a lot more complicated. What I mean by this is if you look on the right hand side here, there's a lot of different formats. The first one, we're spelling out the day of the week. We're spelling out the month, and then we have the day and year. The other one, we're abbreviating the month, day, and year, and then we have a time, and we also have the time zone it's in. There's even Julian format. There's a lot of different formats. If your date column just ha simply has the date portion, such as 9-17-2008, things will work pretty easily. Things get complicated when we start to use those timestamps, which can contain hours, minutes, and seconds. Again, as we talked about, the most important thing is understanding how it's formatted before you start working with it. Let's go over that a bit more by looking at an example. If you query a date time and you say something like where the purchase date is 2016-12-12, you aren't going to get any results back, and this is because it's in this format that also has the hours, minutes, and seconds. Sometimes you need to convert it because maybe for your analysis, you don't may maybe care about the level of detail. If you do, you can be very specific and say what you're looking for, but a lot of times we're just looking at things down to the day level. Knowing how to change this and manipulate it is important. To do this, we have some different functions that we can use to manipulate. SQLite supports five different date and time functions, as displayed on the screen. So you can pull out the date of something. If you're working with the timestamps, you can also just pull out the time. There's also the Julian day. There's a lot of different functions here that we can use depending on what we're hoping to do with dates. What you can see is that all of these kind of follow a similar format. You start with declaring your function, and then you do your time string and modifier. The time strings are what you want to extract from the date time function. As you can see here, what we have are a lot of different time strings we can use. We can extract the day and the month. We can extract the seconds, hours, years, and minutes. Really, any piece of information we're able to extract from that date time stamp. Then what happens after we add in our timestamp string and modifiers, there's also a couple of modifiers that SQLite supports. To go into a little bit more detail into this, the time string can be in a couple different formats, as shown here. I'll provide some resources for you. There's a lot of great resources on the web, and there's just one format that it has to be in. 
Just pay attention to what you're looking for and then how you want to format it. And the same thing goes with the modifier. A time string can be followed by zero modifiers or multiple modifiers. Each modifier transforms that is applied to the time value is applied from left to right. The order is really important when you apply your modifiers and keep that in mind when you're doing this. Okay, so that's an introduction to working with date and time formats in SQL. In our next lesson, we're going to continue this discussion by going over some more specific examples. This should help you understand how to use the functions we've discussed even better. So I hope you're looking forward to that. I'll see you there. Welcome back. As we continue our discussion on data manipulation and transition to data analysis, we're finally going to get to one of my favorite topics in SQL, case statements. When you're conducting data science, you're always needing to transform variables or recode the data in order to help you with your analysis. As you know by now, most of our time is spent cleaning up this data. Case statements are really easy to start to do this. We use them a lot when we're doing things like when we're hiding coding or taking an individual categorical variable and creating its own column out of a binary variable. We also do it when we want to create different groupings. So a lot of times when we're doing some type of forecasting or predicting, we want to create bins of what we're going to predict. Case statements can help with all of these tasks, which is why they're, gr they're great to cover and we're gonna do that in this video. After this lesson, you should be able to define what a case statement does, describe some situations in which a case statement is useful, explain what each part of the case statement syntax does, use a case statement using appropriate syntax, and explain how to categorize or bin your data. Let's begin. The case statement is a built-in function that mimics an if-then-else kind of statement found in most programming languages. This can be used in select, insert, update, and delete statements. The logic that the case statement takes is as follows. You're going to say case, and then when, and then you'll have a condition. Then after you say the condition, you'll put then, and what the result expression will be. So you could have multiple cases when it's a certain expression, and what you want the result to be, and that could go on for a while. When you're done with that, if the expression declared in the when part of the statement is not one of those cases then, at your option, you can elect to say what else the result would be, and then you end your expression. This shows just an outline of what it would look like. Let's look at a simple case statement as an example. Let's say I want to reclassify my cities, and I'm interested in looking at just the Calgary cities. And so I want to create a new column that's Calgary or other for my city. To do this, I'm going to say case city and then when it's Calgary, and I have that in my quotation because it's a string, then I'm going to classify it as Calgary. Also, I'll classify it as other, then I'm going to end this and I'm going to call the calculation Calgary. Here I also pulled in some additional information about the employee, the first name, the last name, their ID, and then I have the city. I pulled in the city so you could see if it's classified right. And as you can see here, that's true. And Lethbridge is classified as other. And then you can see Calgary, there's a classification as Calgary. This is just a quick way that now I create my own binary variable for a categorical variable. Instead of calling it Calgary, I could have also named it a zero or a one, and this would have been a really great method for a lot of the algorithms that we use, especially in clustering, where you don't want to, where you don't want to use categorical variables. So you transform that into the one hot encoding. The only thing I would do differently here if I wanted to do that would be instead of calling it Calgary or other, I would call it Calgary with one and then other would be zero. You can also use this as a search though. For this example, I'm going to show you how you could add a couple of the cases together. Here what I'm looking at in the Chinook database is how I'm going to classify my tracks. 
I want to classify them based on the number of bytes they have. Again, we have discussed a little bit earlier in the course how we do this when we're doing predictive modeling or forecasting. So here, we may want to bin all of our small sales customers into one and predict their future sales, or large scale customers into another, and so on and so forth. In this case, I'm going to be looking at the size of the tracks, and so I want to bin the bytes. Again, it starts the same way. I say case, I'm treating it just as I'm selecting another column. So you can see I have my select statement, I have my selected track ID, name, bytes, and then I say I want it to select the case. It starts when bytes, but this time I have an expression, so when bytes are less than 300,000, then I'm gonna classify this as small. When the bytes are greater than or equal to 300,001 and less than 500,000, then it's gonna be classified as medium. And then I have my large category, which would be anything greater than or equal to 500,001 bytes. I also put on here the else, and I put that for other. You could leave this blank, and it will just classify back as a null. But this was just in case there wasn't something I caught. However, the way we've written this should have caught everything. You can then see that in the table, I filled in the blanks, and you can see how it's starting to classify this. So this is just a really nice way to start to create bin groupings for my different statements. Another example of what you can do, instead of saying when it's greater than or less than something, is calculate another field. So for example, let's say you have two different periods and you want to classify and count the sales by those periods. You could say when the period is between one and five, then the net sales, else zero. This is creating a condition that is based on, and you can classify sales during that period. So just something to remember is that the then doesn't always have to be a word or a number. It can be a field from another column. All right, so I just took you through a few examples of what you can do with a case statement. Again, this is something you really want to learn so you can understand all of the uses for them. Honestly, it'll probably surprise you how often you'll use case statements in your work and what you're able to do with them. So I definitely recommend extending what you've learned here by reading up on the resources and articles regarding case statements. Then be sure to practice and start using them and explore all you can accomplish with case statements. So far in this course, we've learned a lot of statements and functions and have gone over quite a few tips and tricks that kind of help you put everything together. In this video, we're gonna talk about another useful feature you can keep in your back pocket. We're going to talk about using views, including what they are and how you can use them. Sometimes when you're in a sticky situation and don't know how to solve it, views can really just help you simplify the queries you write. After this lesson, you'll be able to discuss how and when to use views with your queries, explain how to use the as function with views, and explain the benefits and limitations when using views. So as we've talked about earlier in the course, we're always combining data from multiple sources or transforming it in some way. As you know, sometimes things like the order of operations can get a little tricky. Instead of creating a whole new table, sometimes we can create the illusion of a table by using a view. A view is essentially a stored query, and it helps us clean up our queries and simplify what we have to write. In a view, you can add or remove columns without changing the schema. You're not actually writing the query to the database or anything. What you're doing is you're kind of storing it for the time being. This is really helpful and pays off when we use it to encapsulate queries. The syntax for this is you're just going to create and you can either specify a temporary view or just create a view. You can also add in if not exists. So if it doesn't already exist, then you have the view name and you state what the conditions you want to go into the view. An important thing to remember with this, 
again, is the kind of illusion that you're creating in the table. It's only stored for the duration of a session. So it's important that if you're using the view in your query, you can save the query. And then you come back, and then if you come back the next day and start a new session, and you're having errors in your queries, it's probably because you didn't create that view again. So just keep this in mind. It will save you some headaches and time in the long run, but a view won't be a permanent fixture in your SQL code. Let's take a look at an example. Let's say I want to get a count of how many territories each employee has. If you look at our ER diagram, this information is separated out from each other. I'm going to create a view so that on that view, I can just run a simple count on the number of territories. So here, I will create my view. Then for my view, I'm just going to call it as my view. Then the as is really the select statement. Remember how before we've used as as an alias to say what we want our column name to be? You can think of a view as a whole table, but now you're saying, what do you want in all of that table? Your as is going to be a select statement for what I want in that view. I'm going to indicate all of the columns I want and where I want those columns from. Here, even in my view, I'm going to join multiple tables together to create this. You can then see that if you execute this query, you should get a little status update that it was executed. To actually view the data though, you'll need to use a select statement. For this, I'll just add select star from my view. And you can see the table output there. If I didn't want this view anymore, when I hit in my session, it will go away. Or I can just drop the view so to do this, I will just say drop view and then the name of my view, which is my view. Now that I have my view out there, I can actually perform even more queries on top of that. I can now take that view and I can select the counts in the territory descriptions. For example, this will give me an idea of the counts of how many territories that each employee has. I can then group it by the employee's last name and first name. Now I can see the total count for each territory of what each employee has. This would have been a little bit more complex to do if I tried to do it all at once, but creating view just made things really simple. The beauty of the view is that it can be used like a table, but it's unlike a table in that you don't have to have ETL or run ETL on any of the data. This helps a lot by encapsulating complex queries or complex calculations that you're trying to write. It can really help simplify it. It can also be used in pretty much any database except for stored procedures. Views are really most helpful if you need to join a set of tables and you're having trouble getting calculations, particularly those complex ones dealing with the order of operations in the right order to get the output you're looking for. Another benefit of views includes different securities or write capabilities. We talked about not being able to write data to an environment or to a particular database. Views are helpful because you're creating a view of a table but not actually writing data to that table. This is a way to get around some of those database writing limitations. Another thing that views are helpful for is to create a stepping stone in multi-level queries. For example, Let's say you create a query that counts the number of cells that each person has made. You could then write a query that groups the salespeople into a particular group. Then you can count the cells of that group as well. It just creates this multi-level dimension that you wouldn't have been able to do elsewhere. And then it also helps so that you're not transferring any data through an ETL process. So as you can see, views are really useful. Just remember that views are temporary and are only going to be good for that session. If you're reusing a query, you'll have to recreate that view in another session as well. Views are definitely something that will come in handy if you're in a particularly sticky situation or having some trouble with your calculation. It can definitely make things a lot easier for you, so I encourage you to give them a try and try put them in your queries. Welcome. We're going to shift gears a little bit in this video to talk about perhaps a less exciting but vitally important topic with you, data governance and profiling. 
Now, data governance and profiling is not something that we're actually using SQL for, in the sense that I'm going to teach you a new function or anything, but it's so important when it comes to writing really clean and quick queries, where you're getting this data and how you actually want to get it back. So I want to touch on this a little bit because although this class is about SQL for data science, it's really about the application of using SQL for data science. An important part of that is understanding data governance and being able to profile your data. So after this lesson, you should be able to define data governance and profiling, explain the importance of data governance and profiling in your data appropriately, and discuss some methods to profile your data. Okay. Let's define data profiling first. Profiling your data is where you're looking at either descriptive statistics or different information on the data. And the reason why this is important is because we've talked about how you need to understand your data first before you start querying it. So profiling is a great step to begin to understand your data. It's really simple things that you can do to start to profile your data. Some of the things you can do is start with just understanding how many rows are in the table. You can also look at when was the object last updated, meaning when did the data get refreshed and reloaded, because this may change some of your results. This may change the data that you need to limit it by. If it's getting refreshed nightly or in real time, do you need to set a certain date parameter or are you okay with a consistent flow of data? So understanding these things is essential for understanding how you might want to pare down your data to get what you're looking for. You can also do some column data profiling. So for this example, just start off with looking at what is the actual column data type? Is it a date? Is it a timestamp? Is it a date stamp? Is it a string or an integer? This is going to change how you write your queries for what functions you're going to be able to use as well. Although another, another thing to look at is how many distinct values are in this column. How many rows have no values in them? How many nulls are there? Is this something you need to be concerned about and deal with, or is this some another issue and some of the functions you're working with will take care of that? And then you have your simple descriptive statistics. Minimum, maximum, average, standard deviations, things like that are going to be really helpful in getting you to know your data and profiling it and understanding it. And the reason that this is important is because you need to be able to test your data along the way. So as you start to write your queries, test to make sure you're getting the results back that you expect. If you're doing a left join from a table that has 100 rows on the left side and then 50 on the right side, and you only get 50 rows back, well, you know you did something wrong. Because it should bring back everything from the left side. It should at least have the 100 rows. Understanding your data can help you in testing, and that's why using some of these simple things to look at, such as number of rows, distinct values, minimum and maximum, can really help you get around this space and get you familiar with writing the correct queries in the long run. In terms of governance, this is really dependent upon what the data strategy is at the company you're working for. Some have really strict governance policies, and some are more open and free. In terms of a data site using SQL, it's important to understand what your read and write capabilities are in the different environments. Is there a sandbox you can play in and work in to do some of the transformations and things like that to your data? These are good questions to ask. This is really more so getting in contact with whoever manages this at your organization but understanding the governance around the data and what you're actually able to do is important to know to keep your environments clean. This should go without saying if you've done any programming, but clean up after yourself as you start to write. As you start to really explore your data, you quickly type something and then clean something up and then try something else. Just really keep what you're doing and keep your work really clean. And then also understand what the promotional process is through your environments. If you created a model and you want to give those predictive scores and write them back to the database, what environments do you have set up? Is this something that you're going to be able to go through development, acceptance, and production? What is the process for that and what are you writing it to? 
These are just a few little tips on how profiling your data and understanding governance regulations around them. But it's definitely important to look at this at your organization and find out what these governance policies are so that you know why something may or may not be working. Then you'll have the foresight to be able to write your queries and extract and insert your data into a table in the way your organization views as best practice. We've gone over a lot of different things you can do in SQL, from simple things and just pull some fields to joining multiple tables together, creating different views and case statements. You have a lot of knowledge and are really well equipped with the few things in your toolbox to pretty much do anything you want in terms of extracting, inserting, and updating data. But I think the hard part in learning any programming language is really understanding how it all fits together. So with the next two videos, I want to take you through a few basic principles that will help guide you towards using SQL for your data science. Essentially, how do you bring SQL together for use in data science? After this video, you should be able to discuss the importance of really understanding your data when starting a new problem, as well as discuss the importance of really understanding the business needs before beginning a data analysis. These are just a few things that I use when starting a new problem. I think it's really important to know how to work through a problem from beginning to end. And using SQL for data science, what we're often doing is extracting the data from st some storage system, analyzing it, and then maybe writing back a prediction to the database. This is usually centered around a question or a type of analysis that we're doing, a problem that we want to solve. I think there's a few principles that you can use in making sure that the SQL piece of your work is going through a problem from beginning to end and is successful. All of this starts with the data understanding. This is the most important step. This is why we spent so much time understanding and explaining modeling and ER diagrams and discussing the relationships in your data because understanding your data is key to being able to write successful queries. What I mean by understanding your data is really kind of a combination of data understanding and business understanding. It's definitely data understanding and asking yourself things like, are there lots of nulls value in this? Is the data made up of string values that were just free form or entered? Or is it concatenated dates and times? But then there's also this concept of business understanding, meaning how do all of these pieces and elements relate to each other? If you're new to this subject area and you've never worked with the data before, it's going to take you a little bit longer to write your queries. Because of this, it's going to take you a little bit longer to figure out how does everything work together? How does it join or relate to each other? Or realizing something isn't actually an integer, it's a string. And what does this mean for your analysis? But it'll always be worth taking the time to understand your data as much as you can before you really start to analyze it. It's important to really understand the relationships and the dependencies. That leads us to our second step which is the business or subject area understanding. As you start to get familiar with your data, what will happen is that you'll run into questions about the business problem you're trying to solve, the problem or subject or area that you're looking at. I don't know if steps one or two, data understanding and business understanding are really separate. Usually I'm going back and forth between looking at the data and going back to a subject matter expert or somebody who really understands the core business problem and trying to solve the problem. And I'm asking them more and more questions, going back to the data, then going back and asking more questions. This is essential in being able to really wrap your head around the problem, but also then wrapping your head around the data you're using to try and solve for it. One of the things to be careful for is what I call the unspoken need. You may have a business problem where they say, for example, we want to predict whether or not a customer is likely to buy our product. That seems pretty straightforward and easy, right? But as you dive into the data more, you may start to get questions like, well, what customers? What products? Some of the things that aren't spoken are certain logical exclusions. 
For example, are there certain customers that should be excluded from this analysis? Are there certain cases where past sales shouldn't be added into this model or shouldn't be counted? This is why you have to walk in between that data understanding and business understanding because you frequently need to look at the data to get questions and then you need to go back to the business to understand the problem better. You can think of these steps as two different steps because they're definitely two different tasks that you're doing, but you can also think of them as just a back and forth process you're continually doing. This is going to be the most important aspect though. If you can get this and really understand a problem, the query writing will just come easily. If you really understand your data and understand the problem, writing the queries is just like filling in the blanks. It's going back to that concept we've talked about frequently in the course, to slowly do. Slowly wrap your head around the problem. Slowly wrap your head around understanding the data. And the query writing will actually come rather simply. Okay, let's pause there for now. We'll go over some other things to consider in this next video. More to come. So in our last video, we talked about the idea of understanding your data so that you're writing queries that will help you answer your questions. We're going to continue that discussion here. Part of what you'll do when you're trying to understand your data is you'll start to profile your data. This is where you do descriptive statistics. It's also a good opportunity to identify any data quality issues before really diving into your analysis. It's always a good idea to take this profiling step before you finalize any of the data you're extracting. We're gonna talk about those steps in this video. After this lesson, you should be able to determine and map out the data elements needed for a query, discuss some of the strategies to employ as you begin to write more complex queries, and explain some common troubleshooting techniques to try in your SQL code when it isn't giving you the results you expect. Okay, so to really understand a problem, you really need to map out what are the exact data elements you need. You need to know the data you're gonna go after and understand some of the issues with the data from the profiling you've done. So where do you start with your data and query? If you're always extracting data, it's always gonna start with the select statement. So you're gonna to have to use select and from. What I do is usually write out, okay, where is the data that I need? And then kind of draw out a diagram of the different tables and the pieces of information I need on paper. Basically just creating my own data model and map. I start with this just as the sources and then from each source, I go down and define the fields I need. And then from there, I also define how I'm going to join those different sources together. From that point, I'm going to decide if I need to do any calculations. It's just kind of going through a logical process that I go through. But again, you're always gonna start with select. I mean, that's the great thing about SQL. It's consistent in that way. What I recommend is to start simple especially if you're new to the data. Start with just one table, add in more data, add in another table, check your results, and then go back from there. If you're using subqueries, remember to always start with the innermost query and then work out and build. Start small. That leads us to our next tip, which is test along the way. Don't wait to test your query until you've combined multiple sources together and you have all your calculations done and finished. Think of this as little building blocks. You know, if you write a calculation of the average selling price of something, look at how many values you're getting back for just that calculation from the table and make sure that seems right. Then combine this result with another table and then test that. If you know your data, you can dive in a little bit quicker but this will really make sure that your order of operations is correct. This is key because of, as I said before, it's easy to get results back, but getting the right results back that you expect is a little bit harder. Okay, let's talk about troubleshooting. When troubleshooting, it's important to always start small and simple and slowly start to rebuild the query to see where things went awry. It's helpful to start at the basic things first. 
Okay, I'm getting these fields from this table. Does that work? Yes. Okay, now I'm getting these fields from this table and from another table. What's my join like? Is this working? Okay, yes it is. Slowly start to build it back up in order to figure out where things went wrong. Let's say at this point you're working through a problem and you know your data, you've profiled it, you've tested it, and you've started simple, and you have your query. Be sure that when you're writing it, the next thing to look at is to make sure you're formatting it correctly and commenting it in nicely. I think that clean code says a lot about you. Make sure that it's easy to read. You're using proper indention, you're commenting strategically where you need to, etc. You never know when you're going to need to revisit your query or you're going to need to hand it in to someone else and they need to edit to it from there. Just keep your code clean. Format your comments where necessary and strategically. Then you want to make sure to review what you've done. A lot of times what happens is you'll write a query, you'll be using it for your model, and you'll be looking at different stats and things like that. Then you need to go back and edit and change that query. Always make sure you review the query to see if anything has changed. Has the data changed? Are the business rules different? Do you need to update and change the date indicators? Does anything need to be updated? In general, be really careful when you're going back and using old queries. Okay, that really takes you through a problem from beginning to end. Again, it all starts with the data and problem understanding. Make sure you spend the time there. Make sure you really are spending the time thinking about what you're doing before you actually start writing the queries. I promise it will save you time in the long run. Then go through and really understand your data through profiling it. Make sure you're testing along the way and keeping your code clean and commenting. Those are just a few little tips that I can give you. You're fully equipped now to go and retrieve the data you need, which is exciting because the first step in doing data science is to be able to get your data. You now have that in your toolbox. Reflect on these steps and framework when you look at problems and start writing your queries. All right, go and get your data and start analyzing it.